Next on C-SPAN 2, we return to Capitol Hill for another hearing on the September 11th Commission's recommendations. A House subcommittee will focus on the U.S. government's efforts to conduct public diplomacy in the Middle East. Among the witnesses, Commission Chair Thomas Kane there on the right of your screen and Commission Member Jamie Gorelli. It's just getting underway, and this is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. A quorum being present, the Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled the 9-11 Commission Recommendations on Public Diplomacy, Defending Ideals and Defining the Message is called to order. In the war against transnational terrorism, we are losing ground on a crucial front, the battle of ideas. Words, not just weapons, fuel revolutions, and the language of political liberty and economic opportunity can inspire the victory of life over death, faith over fatalism, and progress over stagnation throughout the Muslim world. The next generation of potential terrorists can be stopped with books rather than bombs if we help empower and mobilize the moderate majority with the vocabulary of hope. Public diplomacy, the cultural exchanges, education programs, and broadcasts used to convey United States interests and ideals to foreign audiences help win the Cold War. But according to the State Department's advisory group on public diplomacy for the Arab and Muslim world, quote, the United States today lacks the capabilities in public diplomacy to meet the national security threat emanating from political instability, economic deprivation, and extremism, end of quote. In the rhetorical arms race for the hearts and minds of the Muslim world, some ask how the most technologically advanced nation on earth is being outgunned by a movement largely based in caves. In our previous hearings on public diplomacy, witnesses described a lack of strategic coherence in U.S. efforts to communicate with global audiences. Successful Cold War structures have been stripped bare and scattered throughout a State Department bureaucracy with other priorities. Since September 11, 2001, the State Department and the Broadcasting Board of Governors have increased the reach and frequency of communications on U.S. policies. New, more aggressive approaches seek to counter any American stereotypes and caricatures dominating the news cycles. But the 9-11 Commission found those efforts still inadequate to meet the threat. They called for, quote, short-term action on a long-term strategy, long-range strategy, end of quote, to compete as vigorously on the ideological battlefield as we do on the military and intelligence fronts. The Commission recommended a clearer message in support of the rule of law, human rights, expanded opportunity, and political reform. And they said we needed to expand regional satellite broadcasting and rebuild scholarship, exchange, and library programs targeted to young people. The Commission's call for reinvigorated public diplomacy adds urgency to the debate already underway over the appropriate mix of U.S. communication tools. Some say mass audience programming based on popular music and other modern advertising techniques lacks necessary depth. Others say the old, more academic methods targeting social elites will not reach the larger body politic. The Commission calls for expansion of both approaches. So we meet this afternoon to examine those recommendations more fully, determine which can be done by the executive branch alone, and which require legislative implementation, and to assess the strengths and weaknesses of public diplomacy as a tool against future terrorist attacks. We are aided in that discussion today by Governor Thomas Keene, Chairman of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, Commission Member Jamie Gorelick, and two other panels of also extremely qualified and experienced witnesses. We thank them all for participation, and we look forward to their testimony. This time, uh, the chair would recognize the ranking member, Mr. Kucinich.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome to uh, Governor Kane and also to uh, Ms. Gorlick. Today's hearing is the third hearing this subcommittee has held on public diplomacy in the Middle East. We've heard from numerous State Department officials, media experts, academics, and representatives from various advisory commissions. We've heard repeatedly that the hatred of the Muslim world towards the United States is growing. However, the truth is that no matter how many hearings we hold on this topic, our public diplomacy in the Middle East is a failure and will continue to fail without changes in our foreign policy. The problem is not that there are cultural differences or different value systems. It is not a failure of the quantity or quality of our message. Our public diplomacy fails because it is derived from a failed foreign policy. We must change our foreign policy if we're going to have credibility in talking about changing hearts and minds. In its final report, the 9-11 Commission made the following recommendation, and I quote, where Muslim governments, even those who are friends, do not respect these principles, the United States must stand for a better future. One of the lessons of the long Cold War was that short-term gains in cooperating with the most repressive and brutal governments were too often outweighed by long-term setbacks for America's stature and interests. End of quote. The Commission is correct in that our foreign policy strategy continues to reflect Cold War mentalities. During the Cold War, the United States supported brutal, dictatorial governments throughout the world because they were strategic allies. Democratic and Republican administrations both supported, with military aid, regimes in Iraq and Iran well, those regimes were torturing citizens and suppressing democratic aspirations. Our policy of arming the Mujahideen before and during the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan led to the Taliban having the ability to flourish there afterwards. The people of the Muslim world remember that the U.S. chose to support these brutal regimes against them. Recent polls, such as those conducted by Zogby International, show that Arab respondents do understand and do respect American values, but they do not see American policy reflecting those values. They saw the horrible pictures of abuses at Abu Ghraib prison. They read about the treatment of detained prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. So why are we surprised that there's harsh feelings towards the United States? Perhaps we have a credibility problem in the Muslim world because people there believe that uh, we have treated them poorly. If we say there's a gathering threat of weapons of mass destruction and we launch an unprovoked attack on another country to capture those weapons, and it turns out that no vast stockpiles were found, our actions look uh, highly questionable at best, and our credibility as a nation is undermined. Who's going to believe America the next time a U.S. Secretary of State makes a presentation at the United Nations calling for the world community to participate in a plan for war. No amount of American pop music, Fulbright scholars, or athlete exchange programs is going to conceal the false pretenses of a war. Today we'll hear again how much money and more attention should be spent to influence public opinion in the Arab world and to carry a message of hope to Muslims. Mr. Chairman, I think that our national policy makers have to match words and deeds, or pretty soon the United States will lose all credibility, not just in the Middle East, but throughout the entire world. Let's figure out what the message is before we discuss how best to beam it across satellites to the Middle East. And let's have the makers of our foreign policy come testify and be held accountable for their decisions. I want to thank the witnesses here today. And I want to thank uh, Governor Keene and uh, Ms. Gorlick for the honest assessment they've made of our nation's vulnerabilities in the 9-11 Commission report. And I hope that your testimony today and continued advocacy 
will help to spearhead serious deliberation and reform by this and future administrations and Congresses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Governor Kane and uh, Commissioner Gorelick, we, um, uh, we at a subcommittee have less members, so I'm going to have each of them uh, make statements, and we'll get to you real quick. Thank you. Uh, at this time, the Chair would recognize the Vice Chairman, uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your efforts in having what is the first hearing on examining the need for a clear and coordinated public diplomacy strategy. Uh, the 9-11 Commission report contains numerous recommendations for change both within the government structure and government policy, and one key aspect of the report deals with public diplomacy or the ability for the United States to project its public image and accurately portray our nation to people around the world. Public diplomacy is a campaign of words and images, and it can be easily lost. Uh, to portray the United States as the great nation that it is, we must set the tone and message, or more radical groups will define our message. In the 9-11 Commission report, it states that to Muslim parents, terrorists like bin Laden have nothing to offer their children but visions of violence and death. In this war of uh, diplomacy and public policy, we have to recognize that the Islamic extremists in which we are defending ourselves promote a culture of celebrating and glorifying death both of innocent lives and of suicide bombers. And certainly, that means that our task is, just gr is greater than just defining who we are. Uh, I look forward today to uh, hearing from the witnesses and hearing their recommendations on public policy uh, and reform. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. This time the chair would recognize the uh, gentlelady from New York, uh, Ms. Maloney. Th thank you, and I and welcome to Governor Keene and, and Ms. Gorelick. Mm -hmm. I, I just left another hearing in financial institutions where uh, Vice Chairman Hamilton is uh, testifying. I, I join my colleagues and really the American public in thanking you for your bipartisan, uh, thoughtful work. Uh, the 9-11 Commission report is uh, more popular than Harry Potter. Uh, so I hope people not only read the, the commission report, but uh, will work to uh, implement all of its suggestions. And along with my colleague Chris Shays and others, we have formed a caucus that will be working together uh, to really uh, support the implementation of the recommendations. I, for one, uh, believe that the commission should be extended with legislation and it will be the first bill that I introduce uh, when we go back into session in a bipartisan way. I, I know that you're fundraising, uh, but I do not believe that your important work uh, should depend on bake sales. I would prefer, Governor Keene and Ms. Gorelick, for you to be spending your time uh, testifying and not having to fundraise with, with private money. Your work is tremendously important. Nothing is more important than securing America and taking every step uh, to prevent uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, so I, I hope that this will be as successful as the legislation that Chris Shays and I uh, authored creating the commission and, and uh, uh, really supporting the legislation to extend the, the operation of the commission until you got all of your work done. Uh, again, I thank you for an excellent job and I look forward to to your testimony today. Uh, your commission report uh, really uh, mirrors what the advisory group on public Dipo diplomacy, the General Accounting Office, the Heritage Foundation, and the Council on Foreign Relations. They all issued reports uh, stating that a greater emphasis is needed by our government on public diplomacy, uh, that we cannot allow the terrorists to define who we are and what we stand for. And so I would. Uh, uh, request permission to place in, in, in uh, my long opening statement, but I uh, look more forward to hearing your comments today. And thank you for your for your many contributions so far. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. I, I need to uh, confess that we don't have four witnesses before us today. Uh, starting out, mispronouncing both your names has set a bad precedent, Governor Kane and Gorelick. Uh, so we'll, we'll call them that and nothing else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lotret. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was going to call him that anyway, but <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I want to uh, first begin by praising you and uh, Ranking Member Kucinich for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, one of the, the most intriguing things about the September 11th report has been all the different facets uh, and different uh, things that the United States has done and needs to do since September 11th. And 
like Ms. Maloney, uh, Governor Kane, I was just down at the Financial Services Committee with your sidekick, uh, Congressman Hamilton. A and I want to praise not only the both of you, but all of the Commission members for all of the good work you've done in the last month and not only uh, getting the tough work done and doing your report in a bipartisan, nonpartisan way, but also taking all of your valuable time to explain it to us and, and to the American people. And I, I really think that you have been on television probably more than the Summer Olympics, and you've done, uh, I think, a really a good workmanlike job. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, I think it's important that we talk about uh, the public policy considerations in the Middle East. And uh, I just want to hearken back to Congressman Hamilton and what we learned in the, in the Financial Services uh, Committee uh, meeting that you were at, Mr. Chairman, and Ms. Maloney was at as well. And, and one of the, the astounding things, as I read the September 11th report, was the, the fact that this whole enterprise on September 11th cost less than $500,000, that it took less than $500,000 for 19 madmen uh, to create such terror and devastation in the United States of America. And, and what we learned, uh, and what you learned, and, and was shared with us today, is that this, even this paltry sum of a half a million dollars wasn't financed, as many believe, by Osama bin Laden. It didn't come from his personal wealth. It didn't come from his inherited wealth. It came from charities, uh, Islamic charities, both uh, witting and unwitting, I think the report indicates. Uh, and uh, as we looked at the ramifications, uh, particularly of Title III of the Patriot Act, as we try to ramp down and, and get a handle on some of the financing that goes into to terrorism, we now have partnership agreements with 94 countries in an attempt to control the flow of money to terrorists. Uh, and I think your report uh, gives us further evidence and ammunition as we pursue that. But its relevance to this hearing is that when you're dealing with 94 other separate and sovereign states, a number of them have Islamic majorities. And if we're going to be successful, we can go about it the old way and just go out and catch the bad guys and, and you know, follow the paper trail and find their money, or we can attempt to, to do it a different way. And, and that's where public diplomacy uh, comes in. And I'm, I'm very hopeful, and I'm looking forward to your testimony today. Again, uh, all of the outstanding work you've, you've done already. But our challenge needs to be not only to deal with this generation of terrorists in an effective way, uh, but to make sure that the next generation of terrorists at least has a competing message uh, that's believed by the United States of America. And I thank you very much for being here today, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. This time the chair would recognize Mr. Platts before we go on to our witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will just uh, want to add my words of thanks for your very important and very substantive work. Uh, we're a grateful nation because of your efforts and, and hopefully uh, will be successful in moving forward and embracing uh, your ideals. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Before swearing the witnesses in, I ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose, without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record without objection so ordered. Uh, as is the practice of this committee, the full committee and the subcommittee, we swear on all our witnesses. I only chickened out once in umpteen number of years with Senator Byrd. But if you all would stand, <laughs> raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. No, for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. One of the nice things about uh, uh, our subcommittee work is we can give the witnesses, excuse me, the, the uh, members 10 minutes to question. We ha get in, can get into an issue a little more in depth, and we'll do that. Uh, and uh, Governor Kane, uh, thank you, and we'd love to hear your statement. Okay. Uh, Chairman Shays and Ranking Member Kucinich and, uh, and distinguished members, I want to thank, by the way, the chairman and the ranking member and the other committee members for their very thoughtful statements. I might say that the chairman and other members of this committee were some of the first to spot the seriousness of the problem that finally resulted in 9-11. I thank them for their foresight um, on this matter. There weren't, there weren't many people out there with you at the time. Thank you. Uh, we are honored to appear before you today. Um, we want to thank you and the leadership of the House of Representatives for the prompt consideration you are giving to our recommendations. We're grateful to you and the leadership of the entire House. The findings of this commission were endorsed by all members, five Republicans and five Democrats. You see, we share a unity of purpose on the commission, and we'd like to call upon Congress and the administration, even in this very difficult season, to display the same spirit of bipartisanship as we collectively seek to make all our country and our people safer and more secure. 
Terrorism is the number one threat to the national security of the United States. Counterterrorism policy must be the number one priority for the President, and that's any President. And this Congress, or perhaps any Congress, and that's going to go for the foreseeable future. We cannot succeed against terrorism by Islamic extremist groups unless we use all elements of national power. And that means military power, it means diplomacy, it means intelligence, covert action, law enforcement, economic policy, foreign aid, homeland defense, and yes, of course, the subject of today, public diplomacy. If we favor any of those tools uh, while neglecting others, we're going to leave ourselves vulnerable and weaken our national effort. And by the way, that's just not our view. That is a view of every single policymaker we interviewed. We cannot then concede against, succeed against terrorism with one tool alone. I'll give an example. When Secretary Rumsfeld testified before us, he told us this. He said he can't get the job done with the military alone. For every terrorist we kill or capture, he said, more can rise up to take their place. He told us the cost-benefit ratio is simply against us. Koffer Black told us, you can't get the job done with the CIA alone. And what became clear to us as we heard these leaders and so many others is that the U.S. government remains geared to Cold War threats. We're still in many cases talking about great power threats. Our government still today is not geared to deal with the threat from transnational Islamic terrorism. The threat to us today is not from great armies anymore. The threat to us comes from the beliefs. Those beliefs that propelled 19 young men to take their lives simply to do the greatest possible harm to us. The military struggle is part of that struggle we face. But if you think about it, far more important is the struggle for the war of ideas. As much as we worried about bin Laden and Al-Qaeda, and we do worry about that, we should worry far more about the attitudes of tens of millions of young Arabs and hundreds of millions of young Muslims. Those who sympathize with bin Laden represent in the long term a far greater threat to us. They represent the wellspring to refresh the doctrine of hate and destruction no matter how many Al-Qaeda members we capture or kill. For those reasons, Mr. Chairman, we welcome the opportunity this afternoon to address this question of public diplomacy. The United States is heavily engaged in the Muslim world and will be for many, many years to come. The American engagement is resented. Polls in 2002 found that among American friends, now let's take Egypt for an example, Egypt is the recipient of more U.S. aid from the past 20 years than any Muslim country by far. Only 15 percent of the people in Egypt have a favorable opinion of the United States of America. In Saudi Arabia, another friend, that number goes down to 12 percent. And two-thirds of those surveyed in 2003 in countries from Indonesia to Turkey were very or somewhat fearful. And they were fearful that they feared the United States might attack them. I really believe this. At this time, the support for the United States has plummeted. Polls taken in Islamic countries just after 9-11 suggested something quite different. At that point, people thought we were doing something right. And there was a lot of support for us at that point, even in the Arab world, for our fight against terrorism. But by 2003, the bottom had fallen out of that support in most of the Muslim world. Negative views of the United States among Muslims, which have been largely limited to countries in the Middle East, have spread. Since last summer, Favorable ratings for the U.S. have fallen from 61 percent to 15 percent in Indonesia and from 71 percent to 38 percent among Muslims in Nigeria. 
Now, what we know is that many of these views are uninformed. At, at worst, some of these views, of course, are informed by cartoonish stereotypes, the coarse expressions of fashionable accidentalism among intellectuals who characterize the United States values and our policies. Local newspapers and a few influential satellite broadcasters like Al Jazeera often reinforce that jihadist theme that portrays the United States again and again as simply anti-Muslim. The small number of Muslims who are committed to Osama bin Laden's version of Islam, we can't persuade them. We've got to jail them or we've got to kill them. That's the bottom line. But among the large majority of Arabs and Muslims are opposed to violence. And among those people, we must encourage reform, freedom, democracy, and perhaps above everything else, opportunity. Even though our own promotion of these messages will be for a while limited in its effectiveness, simply because we are the ones who are carrying the message. Muslims themselves will have to reflect on such basic issues as the concept of jihad, the position of women in their societies, the place of non-Muslim minorities. We can promote moderation. We cannot assure its ascendancy. Only Muslims themselves in their own countries can do that. So the setting is difficult. 40% of adult Arabs are illiterate. That's two-thirds of them are women. One-third of the broader Middle East lives on less than $2 a day. Less than 2% of the population has access to the Internet. The majority of older Arab youths have expressed a desire to immigrate, particularly to Europe. So this is fertile ground. This is fertile ground for any ideology which is dedicated to hate. This is the kind of soil in which it can grow best. So in short, the United States has to defeat an ideology, not just a group of people, and we must do, some, un, un, do so under very difficult circumstances. Now, how can the United States and its friends help moderate Muslims combat these extremist ideas? As a commission, we believe the United States must define its message. We believe that we have to define what we stand for. And we believe that we simply have to offer an example of moral leadership. We've got to be committed and show we're committed to treating people humanely, to abiding by the rule of law, of being generous and caring about our neighbors. See, America and its Muslim friends can agree on respect for human dignity and the belief in opportunity. To Muslim parents, terrorists like bin Laden have nothing to offer their children, as we've said, but violence and death. America and its friends have a crucial advantage, because we can offer, if you're a parent in the Muslim world, we can offer you a vision. And that vision can give their children a better future. If we heed the views of thoughtful leaders in the Arab and Muslim world, we believe we can seek a moderate consensus. Our vision of the future should stress individual, educational, and economic opportunity. Our vision includes widespread political participation and contempt for indiscriminate violence. It includes respect for the rule of law, openness in discussing differences, and tolerance for opposing points of view. Where Muslim governments, and this even goes for Muslim governments that happen to be friends, when they do not respect these principles, the United States must stand for a better future. One of the lessons of the Cold War was that the short-term gains in cooperating with the most repressive and brutal governments was sooner or later outweighed by long-term setbacks for America's stature and interests. Above all, we as Americans must not be hypocrites about our own values. American foreign policy is part of this message. American, America's policy choices have consequences, right or wrong. 
It is simply a fact that American policy regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and American actions in Iraq are dominant staples of popular commentary across the Arab and Muslim world. Now, it doesn't mean that the United States' choices have been wrong. It means those choices must be integrated with America's message of opportunity to the Arab and Muslim world. Neither Israel or hopefully a new Iraq will be safer if worldwide Islamic terrorism grows any stronger. So the United States has to do a lot more to communicate its message. Reflecting on bin Laden's success in reaching Muslim audiences, as the chairman mentioned this, I think, Richard Holbrook wondered, how can a man in a cave out-communicate the world's leading communication society? Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage worried to us that Americas have been exporting our fears and our anger, not our vision of opportunity and hope. Just as we did in the Cold War, we need to defend our ideals abroad, and we've got to defend them vigorously. America does stand for values, and at our best, we always have stood up for those values. If the United States does not act aggressively to define itself in the Islamic world, the extremists are going to define us instead. Recognizing that Arab and Muslim audiences rely on satellite television and radio, the government has become some begun some promising initiatives in television and radio broadcasting to the Arab world, Iran, and Afghanistan. These efforts are just now beginning to reach some large audiences. The Broadcasting Board of Governors has asked for larger resources. They ought to get them. The United States should rebuild the scholarship, exchange, and library programs that reach out to young people and offers them knowledge and hope and where such assistance, by the way, is provided, it should be identified as coming from the citizens of this United States. At this point, I'll turn to my colleague and one of the most productive and uh, intelligent and hardworking members of the Commission, uh, Jamie Gorelick. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gorelick, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I think uh, that your mic may not be on. Uh... Here we go. As I said, thank you uh, to both chairmen. Uh, let me reiterate just a few points and then address the rest of our agenda. Um, as uh, Chairman Kane said, we are losing the war of ideas. We clearly need to kill or capture those who are most hardened against us. But the challenge for us here and the subject that we are addressing today is how to separate out the vast majority of Muslims who are currently providing support and affirmation to those who are the hardened extremists. And that is the challenge. Uh, and we have concentrated on the first category at the expense of the second. And the message I hope you take away and that we hope you take away from our report is that if we do not address the second challenge, the threat that we face will pale in comparison to the one that we face today, because we will have created and sustained tremendous hostility against us across the Muslim world. We have lost the high regard of most of the world, and that is a stunning conclusion of our report, and we have to regain it. Our national security depends on this as much as it does on the might of our military and on the capability of our intelligence community. The problem is that we, as uh, Secretary Armitage said, we are exporting our fears and our anger. And we are not seen through any lens but the lens of our military, and the lens of, of, of corporate America. We are more multifaceted than that. We have fought to protect the lives of Muslims. We have helped in innumerable ways in the Muslim world, and that message has not gotten through. We have receded in so many ways from the work that we did in the 1980s and before. 
So what can we do? Well, first of all, to Congressman Kucinich's point, we have to do the right thing. We have to be moral. We have to be generous. We have to be right thinking. We have to abide by the rule of law. We have to communicate the very best values of our country that have been such a source of strength for us in our foreign policy uh, before this. It is ast astounding and, and striking how the support for us has hemorrhaged in the last few years. The world was behind us after 9-11. Even the Muslim world sustained su support for us invading Afghanistan. And that support has hemorrhaged, and it has real consequences for our national security. So we need to do the right thing. Second, as Chairman Cain said, we have to offer an alternative vision of hope and opportunity. And I'm, I'm going to address the specifics of that in a moment. And third, we have to communicate, or we will be defined by others. And we have unilaterally disarmed in our communication. We have receded from the world. We have slashed the budgets of, of libraries. We have cut our speakers' bureaus. We have canceled book sus subscriptions. We have cut our staff at the very time when we need to be building up our presence and our outreach to the Muslim world. The United States and its friends have to stress educational and economic opportunity. The United Nations, we say, has rightly equated literacy as freedom. The international community is moving toward a concrete goal to cut the Middle East region's illiteracy rate in half by 2010. And it is targeting particularly women and girls, and it is supporting programs in adult literacy. Help is needed to support even the basics, like textbooks that translate more of the world's knowledge into local languages and libraries to house such materials. Education about the outside world and other cultures is extremely weak. For example, there is very little emphasis in Arab education systems about American history, European history, or Chinese history. There needs to be a broader understanding of cultures, cultures outside the world of Islam. We should add, of course, that Americans, too, need to better understand the world of Islam. Our own education system in this respect also needs improvement. More vocational education is needed in trades and business, business skills. The young people of the Muslim world need to have a vision of opportunity. Right now, most young Muslims are in the hands of madrasas, many schools that teach hate and that don't communicate or teach usable skills. Now, you can hardly fault a parent for sending a child to one of those schools when there is absolutely no alternative. And we have not helped to create those alternatives. We need education that teaches tolerance, the dignity and value of individuals, respect for dif different beliefs across the board. We recommend specifically that the United States government offer to join with other nations in funding what we call an International Youth Opportunity Fund, where funds would be spent directly for building and operating primary and secondary schools in those Muslim states that show their own commitment to sensibly investing in public education. A second agenda is opportunity and jobs. Economic openness is essential. Terrorism is not caused by poverty. Indeed, many terrorists come from fairly well-to-do families. Yet when people lose hope, when terrorists, when societies break down, when communities fragment, those are the breeding grounds for terrorism. Backward economic policies and repressive political regimes slip uh, into societies that are without hope where ambition and passions have no constructive outlet. The policies that support economic development and reform have political implications. Economic and political li liberties, after all, and they tend to be linked. Commerce, especially international commerce, requires ongoing cooperation and compromise. The exchange of ideas across cultures and peaceful resolution of differences through negotiation and the rule of law. Economic growth expands the middle class. 
which can be a constituency for further reform. Successful economies rely on vibrant private sectors, which have an interest in curbing indiscriminate government power. The bottom line is those who control their own economic destiny soon desire a voice in their communities and in their political societies. We have very specific recommendations about free trade, which you will see reflected in our written statement. But we believe that a comprehensive U.S. strategy to counter terrorism has to include economic policies that encourage development, more open societies, and opportunities for people to improve the lives of their families and enhance prospects for their children's future. Mr. Chairman, let me sum up for both of us and for the 10 members of our commission by coming back to the question that you put to us about the successes achieved by and the challenges facing U.S. public diplomacy efforts. The issues surrounding public diplomacy have been with us since September 12, 2001. It has not gone without notice in the policy community, among commentators, among pollsters, among individuals familiar with the Muslim world itself, that public diplomacy is critical. And yet, our assessment of where we are in this regard is not a good one. Public diplomacy is hard. It faces enormous challenges and has had few successes in recent years. But we are convinced that we cannot win this war on Islamist terrorism unless we win the war of ideas. We need to win the hearts and minds of a great swath of the globe from Morocco to Malaysia. We need to understand public diplomacy in the proper, proper sense of the word. It's not just the mechanics of how you deliver the message. It is the message itself. It is the message of our values, which have been such a strength for this country over centuries. We have to communicate that America is on the side of the Muslim world, that we stand for political participation, personal freedom, the rule of law, that we stand for education and economic opportunity. Of course, we cannot take on the responsibility for transforming the Arab and Muslim world. It's up to courageous Muslims to change their own societies. But they need to know that we are on their side. They need to know that we are there to help. They need to know that we offer a competing vision. They need to know about us and what we have in common with them. And with that, we would be pleased to respond to your questions. Thank you very much. Before turning it over to uh, Mr. Turner to ask the first set of questions, I, I thought I would basically see uh, your three points in a statement, so I got a little lazy and didn't write down the specific. Last one was communication. The first two? The first two were do the right thing. That is, be what we know we can be. Right. And the second was? The second was offer an alternative vision, and that is about education and hope. Thank you. Um, the floor will give, uh, the gentleman has 10 minutes, Mr. Turner. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to thank both the commissioners for all of your work and for delivering a wonderful bipartisan report that gives us a roadmap of some great recommendations and raises some very important issues that we have to address as a country. And I've appreciated the commission's availability as the as Congress and the, has uh, sought to have hearings throughout uh, August to be able to learn more about the recommendations so that action can be taken. Um, <clears throat> many times when people talk about the war on terrorism, they talk about the Cold War. And, and one benefit that we had in the Cold War is that communism never declared itself a religion. Uh, communism claimed to um, be for the same things we were for. Uh, in the War of Ideas, they claimed that uh, their people had freedom, that they were leading them to prosperity, that they were, in fact, uh, enjoying equality. And the failure of communism was in the uh, reality that they were not delivering as an ideology uh, those things that they were claiming that they were providing their people, whereby our system, though, surpassed it. In this instance, we have a much different situation in that we have not just battles of ideology and, and ideas. We have um, a, a group that has taken a religion and a religious aspect in its promotion of its ideas. Um, I'm, I'm very leery of the discussions of polls, of the United States' um, uh, um, 
of how the United States is perceived, because I would, I would venture, and my understanding is that if you looked at the polls, not just September 12th, but September 11th, that the United States would have had a great deal of more support in the uh, Middle East and among Muslims um, be viewed more favorably on September 11th than we are now, and yet September 11th we were, uh, I'm sorry, September, the day before. Oh, well, the September 11th, it, on the day that it occurred, um, our perception, positive perception, was probably higher than it is now, but yet it occurred, and we were attacked by 19 uh, young men who killed 3,000 Americans. So the goal has to go beyond just the issue of polls and how we're perceived, because when we're perceived positively, we can still be subject to attack. Um, Governor Kane, you said that, you know, how can a man in a cave out communicate us, and, and that was a great quote that you repeated. And, and our task, though, is, is difficult in that we're trying to change ideas instead of just trying to communicate ideas that are in line with beliefs that, that may be held. And in my opening statement, I, I referenced that in the 9-11 Commission report, you, know, you, you, um, you identify the culture of celebrating death, um, of innocence and, su and uh, of suicide bombers, the emergence of global terrorism and how that feeds together. You know, our, our task is much greater than just defining who we are, than doing the right thing and declaring that we do the right thing. And you note in your report that the United States has liberated Kuwait, fed Somalis, protected Kosovo, um, Muslims in Bosnia, um, and yet we are perceived as being anti-Muslim. But at the same time, even if it's not an issue of, of hate, we have this, this issue in the Middle East that we're up against of the glorification and celebration of, of death. And, and Ms. Gerlich, you talked about the issue of, you know, we can't do this alone. So my question goes to, uh, who are going to be our partners? I mean, even if we're communicating who we are and we're actively using diplomacy so that the opinion polls show us more positively, the, the support for the emergence of global terrorism and the Islamic extremism comes from the cultural issue of this glorification of, of death, of killing of innocents and killing uh, through suicides, which in our culture um, is, uh, is uh, you know, outrageous, considered you know, unthinkable. Uh, where do you see that we can get our help? Well, first place, you know, it's such a perversion of the Muslim religion uh, to hurt innocents and the Muslim in the Koran is a great sin. Uh, these are people who've taken part of a great religion, perverted it to their own purposes, and uh, used it, trying to use it in that way, and it only finds fertile ground where there is areas of total despair and hate and all of that. It's a very small group of people. Uh, I guess what we're saying today is that, uh, one is we don't want it to get any larger, and two, we don't want these people who would currently sympathize with them um, to go any further. In fact, we'd like them to understand what a perversion this is. Uh, people don't know that we've helped Muslims around the world in that part of the world. We haven't told them, and nobody else is going to tell them. Uh, we haven't told our story. Uh, when we, you, you referenced quite correctly, uh, the Cold War. Well, in the Cold War, you know how much this country spent on information agencies and cultural exchanges and education opportunities and uh, I mean we were very very concerned how people thought of us because we recognized in that battle it was a battle for ideas and so when communism got ready to fall the people in Eastern Europe wanted to emulate the United States because they thought so much more of our values and ideals which we had communicated to them in one way or another um, than they did of the ideals and of, of the former Soviet Union. Uh, I think we have to go back to some of those communication techniques, uh, recognizing the fact that libraries are important, that schools are important, that cultural exchanges are important, that, that we have to have one consistent message of who we are. We can't just put out, uh, spending money in communications doesn't do much good unless you have a consistent message. I don't think we've really developed that yet of who we are. But I think your, your point is well taken, and I think we can, but we can move ahead, and I think we can communicate. We've done that in the past. We have, if there's any really revolutionary force in this world, it is and always has been democracy. If we can communicate that and show these people that democracy can give their children 
the kind of lives that they can't even dream about now in the society they live in. That, that's what we have to, I think, be about. Concretely, I would answer your question this way. You might think about reversing some of the changes that we made in the 1990s, where literally we shut down our support for libraries. We actually, you know, threw people out of very, very popular outlets that reflected on Western society. We cut back exchange programs. We cut back scholarship programs. We, we had a very substantial cadre of public information officers that we cut back. We shut down the U.S. Information Agency. So my suggestion to you would be to look at the tools that we used so successfully in the Cold War to communicate, albeit a different message, to see how we might use those tools in this context. Second would be education. We have seeded the one vehicle that can affect the hearts and minds of young people to those who are filled with hate. The school systems are spewing out hate and hate-filled information so that by the time a young person graduates from these schools, he has no skills, no hope, and believes that everyone who is defined as the enemy by someone else, and that would include everyone in this room and everyone in this country just about, uh, has no right to live. So um, we recognize that this is a daunting task. And the fact that it is mixed up in religion, does, you are absolutely correct, does not make it any easier. On the other hand, we aren't doing the most fundamental things to address the problem. And that's why we recommend challenging uh, Muslim countries to invest in public education, and we will help them. You ask who our partners would be in this. If we create, essentially, a challenge fund for education, that could be an enormous help in showing a vision of hope and opportunity. This time, the chair would recognize uh, Mr. Kucinich. Was that uh, 10 minutes? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Governor Kane and Ms. Gorelick. Thank you for your testimony. I thought your statement, uh, your written statement, is very compelling, and there's a lot of questions that I have as a result of uh, reading it. And so uh, I'll begin. The 9-11 Commission report states that, quote, one of the lessons of the Cold War was that short-term gains in cooperating with the most repressive and brutal governments were too often outweighed by long-term setbacks for America's stature and interests on page 376. The report also notes on page 376, American foreign policy was part of the message. America's policy choices have consequences. In light of that, uh, to uh, the governor and to um, Ms. Gorelick, does it make sense to focus on public diplomacy before reevaluating American foreign policy? Governor. Well, what I think what we've suggested is that we've got to stop by reevaluating American foreign policy in these areas and promoting things that we all believe in as a country. I mean, we, as, I, as I said, I honestly believe that democracy is um, the most revolutionary concept as long as we promote it as we understand it and have always practiced it in this country. Uh, and when we, when we don't try to moderate governments that are seen by their own people as anti-democratic and oppressive. It doesn't mean we're going to go attack somebody who's been a friend of ours in a number of ways, is helping us militarily or whatever. But we can use our influence in those governments quite openly to try and moderate them. And we've got to do that, for instance, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi, that, that, it just can't be about oil anymore. It's got to be about something very different. It's got to be about how to change that society and bring a lot of the people in, all those thousands and hundreds of thousands of young people who are under, under 18 and are roaming the streets with no education. Um, got to do something about that. We've got to encourage the government of Saudi Arabia to do something about that. And I think we can, as a government, and not do it overnight, 
but start moving people in hopefully the right direction. And I, some of these leaders, I hope, will see that it's not only United States interests, but very much in their interests if they're going to eventually survive as a family or as a government. So uh, there's, of course, different ways to communicate that message. Uh, one is force. Another one is diplomacy. Some people mistake force for diplomacy. Uh, do you have anything to say about that? Well, my own, my own view is that force is not diplomacy. Uh, and that we are seen now as, I mean, w w when we gave you statistics and said that people in other countries, mainly countries dominated by Muslim populations, a large percentage of the population feels the United States is going to attack their country. That, that's a, I, I thought that was a telling part of the, uh, your testimony. Matter of fact, I underlined it. And um, why do you suppose there are so many nations around the world where people are fearful the U.S. is going to attack them? What, what, what's that about? Well, it strikes me that we could not have communicated our values or our message or our purposes very clearly to those people. And um, that's what I hope one of the things we're talking about today. We begin our uh, recommendations, as you know, with a chapter called What to Do um, a Global Strategy. And, and while much of the focus of public reaction has been on um, how to do it, which is the next chapter, uh, and that has to do with how we organize ourselves in the United States, we, do, we thought it was very important to begin with a look at our foreign policy in key countries around the world, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, for an example. We also note that the places where terrorism will flourish um, are the failed states of the world. And therefore, a major emphasis of our foreign policy has to be the prevention of failed states. The, um, uh, back to Governor Kane, um, one of the things that I've been concerned about is that the reason why we may now have so many countries that fear us is because the, um, the message that was received in many of those countries is that the United States did not have a proper justification for attacking Iraq. Uh, I, I'm not asking you to make an uh, evaluation of that. I know that's you know, beyond the scope of the committee's work. But uh, I just wanted to share with you that um, uh, one of the difficulties that this country will have is that if you go back to 9-11, to with so many people in America believing then and believing now that Iraq had something to do with 9-11, that perception then fed into support for military action against Iraq. Those perceptions remain today, and also in other countries, they perceive it differently. If, if we, it's my thinking that if, if we do not really have a, a kind of a a clear understanding in this country of what the very basis of our policy is, how in the world are we going to be able to construct a foreign policy which has some kind of symmetry? It's actually called coherence. So I just offer that for, for your consideration. I mean, I think that what the Commission has done is to, is to lay out uh, some of the um, ch challenges which this country faces. But all too often in our national experience, we look at image problems as being public relations problems and not having deeper rooted policy uh, derivatives. And so uh, a book by uh, Vorstin called The Image uh, speaks directly to that. 
we think that somehow if we can change the way things appear, that we have addressed the underlying um, realities. And uh, I think that we're still in that in terms of our national experience with respect to how 9-11 is interpreted by uh, a large segment of the American public. And uh, it, it's very difficult, Mr. Chairman, to do what the members of this commission have done, because what you've done is to bring together people who have different differences of opinion, different partisan backgrounds, but you've been able to meld kind of a statement of where we need to go. And I think that uh, your um, uh, addressing the issue of public diplomacy and, and looking and, and calling for an inspection of it, of, of essentially the historical roots of what we're talking about, sets us on the path towards resolution. And, and it's really terrific that you've been able to do that. Now, I'll just try to ask one more question if I have a moment here. And that is that um, uh, U.S. Muslim groups have argued they should have had more input into the Commission's final report. Uh, were Arab American groups consulted during the Commission's investigation? And do you think that uh, U.S. Muslim organizations should be involved in U.S. public diplomacy in the Middle East? I think unless we make use of the, of the diversity of, of this country, we lose one of our greatest weapons. And Arab Americans, obviously, as Muslim Americans even more, are now a very, very important part of the fabric of this country. And we should use them in every way possible. I would second that and just say for the record that we consulted very widely. Uh, I'm sure that time constraints did not permit us to consult with every possible group, but many uh, Muslim American groups uh, were on our list of consultants. Uh, and I would second what Tom Kane has said, which is one of our great strengths is our diversity. That is, we are uniquely among all the countries in the world because of our immigrant background able to reach out to people of all different uh, types, ethnicities, races, uh, much more effectively, or we should be. And we need to counsel with those who can help us in framing our message because the substance of our message should be a good one. And yet we have failed to communicate to the rest of the world our highest values. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Platts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, my appreciation for your work and your participation here today to our commission members. Um, we, we certainly have a lot of work to do, and as you reflect um, the good work of our nation over many years, uh, not just in liberating 50 million Muslims in Iraq and Afghanistan, but Kosovo, Bosnia, Somalia, um, that message isn't being understood or, or fully appreciated uh, in the Muslim community. And somehow to get the message that I personally received when I visited Iraq and uh, with about seven other members, uh, we were up in Kirkuk and meeting with the mayor and city council. And in the opening statement, the mayor of Kirkuk, uh, Ahmad Mustafa, uh, his opening statement to us to bring back to our constituents was, please go home and thank the mothers and fathers of America who are willing to send their children, our soldiers, to Iraq to liberate his people. Uh, mayor Mustafa understood that we were willing to put the lives of our courageous men and women on the line to protect ourselves and to liberate him and his people. Clearly, that's not a message, though, that's understood and appreciated. Um, one of your recommendations is about us uh, doing good work, like the library and scholarship programs, exchanges. Um, we continue to fund, uh, maybe not in those direct programs, the level, we fund a lot of money through the UN. And do you think it's something we need to evaluate because you're in making a recommendation that we should do these things and then say where such assistance is provided, it should be identified as coming from the citizens of the United States, that we give a lot of money for school books and you know, for Palestinians, but it's not necessarily seen as from America. Uh, maybe it's through you know, UN and um, UNESCO, whether it be education, health care, food. Do you think we need to reevaluate um, how we fund programs through the UN, uh, which then is seen as the help uh, helper versus directly 
you know, engaging uh, in these nations. So it's clearly an American initiative, um, not a UN initiative. Well, as we have seen, and among those, uh, those uh, our enemies, the UN is viewed almost as badly as we are. I mean, they they blew up their headquarters, and they they would like to destroy the UN and the community of nations as well. I, I'm sure it's important we keep on working through the UN. Uh, but we also have a number of programs in our government that don't have anything to do with the UN. And very often, whether it's charities or whatever, we, we give a lot of aid. American people are extraordinarily generous. Uh, and uh, we don't identify it as such. Uh, people don't know that's where the aid came from. And we find that out. I mean, people don't know that the food they got in the emergency or the help or the medical care or whatever is, comes from the United States of America. And we're saying, you know, Fine, uh, we'd like to expand that kind of help, but people ought to know where it comes from. People ought to know this is because of the generosity of the people in this democracy, and that we have a, an outreach around the world for people who are in need, and always have had. And we just uh, should not at this point in our history hide our light under a bushel. If I could add um, two comments to that. If you look at our recommendations with regard to Afghanistan, we make a couple of observations that might be of help in, in addressing the question that you just put. Um, first of all, we note that the State Department presence in Afghanistan is woefully understaffed and that we don't really fully ut utilize all the resources of our government um, but mainly rely on our military resources there. Um, second, uh, we heard when we visited uh, CENTCOM, uh, and here are the war fighters uh, uh, saying to us that in both Iraq and Afghanistan, what they find most effective is their ability to deliver assistance. Um, they were proudest of and thought they'd made the most progress uh, with clinics that they'd opened. And um, we heard again and again that money for assistance is rigidly allocated on the ground so that somebody who is on the ground in a community who is able to, to be of help with the face of an American can only give money for a certain purpose and not for another. And so um, individual initiative is blocked almost entirely. So I think if you are interested in trying to address this question, I would dive down to the ground. I would ask the, the war fighters who are on the ground in communities in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, how do you bridge the gap? How do you relate to the mayor of Kirkuk? What can you do for that community? What are the resources at your disposal? How much flexibility do you have to present a good face uh, uh, of America to be of real concrete help. I think that we are too hidebound and too inflexible and not using all the tools that we have when we have wonderful Americans on the ground in, in communities that are war-torn and that need our help. And I think we have those tools and we're just not using them. I, I concur with your observation that direct assistance and, and heard that as well in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Iraq where our soldiers were able to use some of the confiscated funds to then go back and have the flexibility unit by unit to give $1,000 to help improve a drainage ditch, uh, whatever it may be, that direct impact. And, and that kind of relates to one of the challenges for us here in Congress in, in achieving this effort of better public diplomacy, and something that the military, the warfighters told us when we voted on the supplemental uh, last fall, um, and about 18 and a half billion of that, um, I think 87 billion or so, if I remember my numbers, was uh, humanitarian assistance, non-military related, and that was some of the you know really most criticized part of those of us for political reasons, and it was you know we're helping to you know uh, um, rebuild a fire companies or firehouses in Iraq, but we're not doing it for our own, yet your recommendations and what the warfighters are telling us, that humanitarian assistance that would make a difference in the everyday lives of those Iraqis or Afghanis, um, that, that is as important to winning the war on terror as the military effort. And, and so I, if I take 
that message is that internally Congress needs to stop politicizing public diplomacy efforts versus military and, and diplomatic efforts, but it's all part of the same effort and, uh, and truly approaching a more statesman approach um, and, and put the partisan uh, politics aside and, and just doing the right thing. Follow-up question, I, I, I think still okay on time, is um, in doing the right thing, a, a, a challenging um, one of the recommendations is uh, leading by example and, and being the moral nation that we are and in not uh, including in our relations uh, around the world, including with some of our allies. Uh, and, and I'd specifically be interested in your comments uh, regarding like Saudi Arabia um, and how are, are there, is the commission, is there specific things that we should do differently with Saudi Arabia given their internal uh, challenges and how they treat their own citizens that we should consider uh, as uh, someone who's uh, an ally of that nation? Well, we do make a number of recommendations specifically about Saudi Arabia in, a, in our report. And basic bottom line is it just can't be about oil anymore. I mean, that's oil is a very important part of it. It's got to be because the need of the industrialized world for oil is still so great. But that can't be all it's about. Um, because uh, if anything, we, 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 we identify countries, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, that if any of those three areas went the wrong way, that would become a terrible breeding, breeding ground for terrorists. So what we suggest is helping the leaders of Saudi Arabia to move in a direction that many members of the royal family would now like to move in anyway, and giving them a little push, a little help, a little example, uh, and helping them to move in a direction which is in their best interest and which will give their citizens greater freedom, will move women in an area toward, toward greater, being a greater part of the overall economy and the overall um, country, um, and to help them move in those directions uh, with our rhetoric, with our policy, with our people on the ground. And if we do that, we believe we have a much better chance of having a stable Saudi Arabia to work with in the future, and if we don't, we fear the consequences. I would only add this. Um, we call uh, Saudi Arabia a problematic ally, and the problems, we say, are on both sides. We uh, have a, a great deal of mutual mistrust right now between these two countries and our, and our, and our peoples, and that has to be dealt with in a very straightforward way. First, as Chairman Kane said, <coughs> it can't be about oil. It has to be about a mutually uh, adopted and shared set of goals, economic, economic opportunity, a commitment to political and economic reform. We tried uh, to do our part by clearing the air of some of the rubbish that was out there about what the Saudi government had and had not done, what the Saudi royal family had and had not done. But the fact of the matter is that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi. The fact of the matter is that a great deal of the charitable money or money that has flo flowed to uh, bin Laden comes from uh, uh, Saudi uh, sources. The fact of the matter is that the, uh, the support of the madrasas and other school systems around the, around the world that are harmful, uh, uh, a lot of it comes from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Since the attacks on their soil, as Chairman Kane said, they've gotten religion, if you will, and we are much more closely aligned. Uh, but we need to uh, uh, do what we can to create incentives for, for the leadership of Saudi Arabia to stay on a path toward greater democracy and toward, uh, and toward reform. Uh, otherwise, we will have a huge failed state uh, in Saudi Arabia, and that the the dangers there could be enormous. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for your testimony. As a former teacher, I was most interested in your focus on education, and I truly believe we we can win any military war, uh, but as long as madrasas are teaching hatred 
and raising well-educated young people who are willing to be suicide bombers, uh, we will never be safe. Um, I am most interested in how you foresee or how you predict or how do you suggest that we create alternative educational systems in Saudi Arabia and uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, and other uh, Muslim countries. Uh, do you see this as a, you said, an international effort, but as you mentioned, the coalition of the willing, whether it's the United Nations or uh, the commitment to Afghanistan, it, it becomes primarily an American focus. Um, how do we stop Saudi Arabia from funding these madrasas? Do you, how much money do we now spend in our foreign aid for education? Do you think we should shift our entire foreign aid package uh, towards education and providing young people with an alternative? You really cannot fault a Muslim mother for sending her child to a madrasa if that's the only form of educational system that is there for her to approach. <coughs> Also, Governor Kane and Ms. Gorelick, uh, you, you focused a great deal in your, in your uh, original report, 9-11 Commission report, on coordinated responses. How do you see the educational coordinated response from the United States? Uh, should it be under the State Department, under the Education Department? Um, where would this be? How would we implement what we obviously need to do? Thank you. Well, first of all, to say is, as another former teacher, <laughs> I think we come from the same place. Uh, you can't, well, the United States can't do it alone. There's no question about it. And these countries have to see it in their own interest to do it. I mean, part of our job is to convince them of that. Uh, not, by the way, not all madrasas teach hate. And that's a mistake to say that. Uh, but some of them still do. And those are the ones, of course, who are most at fault. But even the madrasas that don't teach hate don't teach much else. Uh, people don't get the kind of skills that they need to have to earn a living uh, at these schools. And therefore, we've got to make these countries understand that to have a trained workforce of intelligent young people is the best thing they can do to give their whole society a better life and certainly to give their young people usable skills for the modern world. Uh, that's in their interest, even more than it's in our interest. And uh, it's, it's the right argument. So it should be an argument that we can make with conviction. And that's the only way I think we're going we're to move on this one, is to, is to really convince these countries. We can help. Uh, I hope we've got monies out there that we can use to help them. But, um, but they've got to they've be committed to it, and it's got to be their initiative and it's got to come from their governments, because we can't do it otherwise. No. The Saudis are already spend a great deal of money on schooling, and the, the, the pressure from us has to be to, for them to examine what their, uh, what their output is from those schools, um, measured in, in uh, what the skills are that young people are learning, and in the values that they're coming out of those schools with. Um, there's been, uh, I would say, a Faustian bargain struck, which is that the schools have been uh, given over to a domain uh, as if their output had no effect on uh, the Saudi way of life. You can't produce unskilled people with um, uh, filled with hate and not expect that to have a consequence for the stability of your country. And um, uh, we make that observation and we would encourage the Saudis to examine their own education system. We're now giving a tremendous amount of aid to Pakistan. And um, we would like to see some incentives there to create an education system that shifts direction. But as you would know better than anyone, this is a generational challenge. Mm -hmm. the, the, the problems that we've identified have been in place for decades, and they're not going to be turned around in a minute. This is a generational challenge. Mm -hmm. 
you, you testified that you would uh, support an international youth opportunity fund, an educational fund. Do you foresee this, for example, in Pakistan, to use one example, as working with the government to set up a youth opportunity educational system that a parent then could decide whether they go to a madrasa or go to the youth educational opportunity system? Do you see literally creating an alternative to the madrasa educational system? Yes, we do. I mean, what we're pushing for basically is that there should be choice of a public school. I mean, that's served our democracy extraordinarily well, the public school. And, and, and we're, what we're suggesting is that these states have got to be encouraged uh, to have a system of their own public schools where there would be an alternative to the madrasas. Do you have a sense of how much of our tax dollars in foreign aid goes to education now in, in developing countries? And how much of a, a foreign exchange program do we have for higher uh, education for Muslims? Do we have a specific uh, uh, program to promote uh, exchange between American and Muslim students? I'll say as a college president, I don't know of one. You don't know of one. <laughs> There may be one out there, but not, nothing, I, nothing I'm aware of, and I think as a college president, I'd be aware of certainly if it was anything, anything large. We do say that the, um, the changes that were made in the 90s in our education programs, in our scholarship programs, in our exchange programs, uh, to essentially withdraw from the field uh, have had a, a deleterious effect on our ability to help in this most critical area. And uh, you could, I mean, you could double our public diplomacy budget, for example, for the cost of a B-1 bomber, and it would probably uh, be a good investment. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know uh, the specific answer to your question, although I'm sure it's readily available, but our general assessment is that we need greater emphasis on education funding. And uh, I'd, I'd like to know how you see this being coordinated. Uh, we have many different departments in our government uh, doing diplomacy. We have the State Department. We have USAID. We have our UN commitments. We have uh, many commitments in many different areas, uh, none of which is coordinated. Uh, one of your themes is that we needed a coordinated intelligence effort. Do you believe we need a coordinated diplomacy effort, uh, all of these various budget lines uh, are independent and uh, they make their decisions independently and it's not uh, coordinated. Do you feel that in the public diplomacy area we should come together under one heading and have a discretion under one person to focus more on the goals that you outlined, uh, specifically education and diplomacy? Well, I assume, and, and Commissioner Gorelick knows a lot more about that than I do, but I assume that the public diplomacy area should be coordinated under the State Department. That's, I would think, part of their job. But, but the, as far as education goes, to um, uh, not for each area of government to know what the other area is doing would be a great mistake. And that would have to be coordinated. We didn't make recommendations as to how to coordinate it. We sort of set out what we thought the ideals were, and we thought perhaps that the administration and Congress and their wisdom would find out the ways to do it. I think it's an excellent question. Certainly, uh, as, as Chairman Kane said, we didn't uh, address this issue specifically in our report, but it would be in line with the kinds of recommendations that we made elsewhere to align responsibility and authority uh, in, in one person to coordinate the many pots of money that uh, operate against the same goal. And I would make sure that you add to the list the considerable funds that are spent for humanitarian aid through the Defense Department. I mean, they are, in fact, the people on the ground in, 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 in many respects. So mm -hmm. I would look at the different sources of funding mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and uh, who controls them. And I would try to make sure that they are uh, working together in a, coordinated, in a coordinated fashion. And I would imagine the administration would want to do that as well. But as it stands now, each of these departments have control over their budgets and their decision making. And they may be duplicating or not working together and therefore are 
message of what America is doing and what we're doing to help becomes. Um, we honestly did not look at uh, the specific question that you are raising, and I know that you have other um, helpful uh, uh, panelists here today. One of the reasons that we uh, suggested uh, and made as a key recommendation a very high-level national, na national counterterrorism center uh, run by someone at a, essentially at a deputy secretary level, is that um, this person would bring together all the tools available across the government mm -hmm. in a coordinated plan. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, while uh, we did not suggest, for example, that all of the budgets relating to education be uh, vested in the National Counterterrorism Center, we do say that all of the planning uh, against the uh, challenges mm -hmm. of Islamist uh, terrorism be vested in one place. Um, as you may recall, in our, in our hearings, when I sat where, where you are, I kept asking who our quarterback is. Mm -hmm. And we found none. Mm -hmm. uh, no one with responsibility across the board for focusing all of the tools of our government against this challenge. And so if I were, um, if, if I were uh, uh, creating this position, uh, as you have the opportunity to do, I would say this person should also look across the board at these kinds of aid programs to advance education uh, in Muslim countries as one of the key important tools. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, I, before doing my time, I just want to introduce into the record um, a statement offered by the Muslim Public Affairs Council and read uh, two to two and a half paragraphs. It says, thank you, Congressman Chase and your staff for asking the Muslim Public Affairs Council to submit written testimony in response to the 9-11 Commission's recommendations on public diplomacy in the Muslim world. The goals of the Muslim Affairs Council comprise two equally important and parallel tasks to promote peaceful relations between the United States and the Muslim world and to make Islam a positive, integral component of American pluralism. The Council views these, these, views these goals as independent. Then further down they say, public diplomacy among non-military goals made by the 9-11 Commission is a vehicle that will be utilized effectively and with leadership to enhance dialogue with the United States and the Muslim world and to create a global constituency to advocate on behalf of our interests, namely by the following. Elimination of terrorism as an instrument of Po uh, political influence in the region, movement uh, towards Middle East peace, three, advancement of uh, a nuclear nonproliferation, four, development of stable democratic governance, and five, restoration of human rights, including rights of minorities and emancipation of women. In short, public diplomacy a means to achieve these goals and not a goal itself. I'll just make reference to the fact that they do then question uh, the term Isl Islamism. Uh, in terms of the agency's, excuse me, the commission's report. So now, why don't I start my questions by taking that up. Uh, I was struck by the fact that if I had done that, I might have been called a racist, even though it's a little different. Obviously, it's not about racism, but, but making that reference that Islamic terrorism. Did you all have a debate about this? And did, in the end, you say, listen, we're not being attacked by the Norwegians? Uh, 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 Christians, I mean, did you, what did, what, what ultimately made you want to state that term um, and, and uh, what should we infer from that? Well, we really wanted to define the enemy. Uh, we think, we said at the commission, and we debated this long hours, talked about it a lot. Um, simply the word terrorism is a war against terrorism didn't to us make a lot of sense, because it isn't really. It's a war against one particular variety of terrorism as practiced by a certain group of people, uh, and they are Islamic terrorists. Um, and so we came, we came really to define who the enemy is by using that term so it wouldn't, um, you know, it wouldn't be too undefined or too vague. You, you, you were part of that debate. <laughs> oh, yes, I was part of that debate. Um, l let me say a, a couple of things. Um, one, we read the National Counterterrorism Strategy and were astonished to find no mention of Islamists, religion, 
parts of the globe. It was as if the enemy were this inchoate tool called terrorism. And uh, we honestly don't believe that you can address the threat in that way. You have to identify the fact that we have an enemy. And the enemy that we have identified is Islamist terrorism, Islamist extremism. It is not the Muslim religion. It is not Islam. It is not Islamic terrorism. It is Islamist. And uh, we care, take some care in defining what that is. But it is uh, uh, basically a very radical uh, uh, group. Uh, uh, as Senator, as uh, uh, Chairman Kane said, uh, a sort of hijacked uh, element of the religion, uh, which defines um, anyone that they don't agree with as uh, infidels worthy of murder. See, the challenge that we have, I think, is in trying to win the hearts and minds of. Uh, quote unquote, the Islamic world and others, um, I happen to believe, for instance, in everything I've read about Wahhabism, that it is a, a fairly aggressive, almost violent approach and extraordinarily intolerant. And yet that defines a nation. It defines um, Saudi Arabia, quite frankly. So I think what you did was extraordinarily important, but I don't think you made the job any easier now uh, in terms of winning the hearts and minds because we're being honest with each other. And that honesty, I think, says we better confront it. And I would view your use of the polls, Governor Kane, um, as, as, as real, but I'm not quite sure how I am to interpret it because I think when you strip open the carpet and you see the bad that's underneath there, you have stirred things up, you have created anger and so on that has to be dealt with. And so I would make the argument that we've got to go through this process. And we aren't going to be so popular right now. I, I happen to look at Churchill and think he wasn't too popular in the 30s. Uh, Neville Chamberlain was a hero. And Neville Chamberlain was dead wrong. So were the French, obviously so were the Germans, and so on. And I'm not, I'm not so sure that having bad polls isn't an indication of something, frankly, and I'd have constituents who would take issue with this, really an indication that we are finally standing up to a reality of fundamentalism within a particular faith that is, faith that is widespread and promoted, frankly, even by governments. Happy to have you comment. Well, as long as you narrow these people down, because you can't say all Wahhabism is Islamic terrorist. Uh, a lot of it is not. Uh, it's a very, very small group of people who have taken it that extra step and said that in order to promote their particular philosophy, you've got to murder, murder a lot of military, a lot of innocent civilians. Uh, that is not even what the majority of Wahhabis believe. Uh, and now, some of the climate that's created by those schools and Wahhabism sets the necessary climate that this particular small group of people can exist within. Yeah, I would think that's, frankly, almost an understatement. Yeah. I mean, we have Saudi Arabia in, in, in um, former Yugoslavia, uh, their, their contribution economically is, frankly, more mosques, uh, teaching their brand of, of the Islamic faith. That's what they are doing. Uh, instead of doing what we would like them to do, which is provide economic assistance and preach tolerance and so on. So it just strikes me that we've got a real big task. I salute you for bringing this up, but I, I believe that uh, three commissions told us before you ever existed, before 9-11 ever took place, they said you have a terrorist threat out there, you need to, to develop a strategy to deal with it, and you need to reorganize your government. They only disagreed on the reorganizing government. But I will say to you, they weren't as explicit as you were to, to narrow the threat in the way you did. And I, and I think that it was important that you did that. I, um, I would like to uh, ask you, um, in terms of the three categories, do the right thing, uh, I, let me just mention about do the right thing. Jimmy Carter wanted to do the right thing. 
And he said, I'm just going to work overtime to negotiate the release of. And what he said to the Iranians, America, what a world. We can keep them for 20 years. All we have to do, do the Iranian government, is negotiate. And you did have a president who said, we're going to treat this as what it is, an act of war. Usually when you have a, even a war, you exchange your diplomats. And here we had a government now holding American diplomats. It was an act of war. Immediately they were returned. And I'd like you to just comment. I don't want to leave on the table this concept that somehow um, force is useless. Uh, diplomacy is the answer. It strikes me that diplomacy without the potential to use force is useless. If, if I've left the Im impression in any way that uh, I think that force is useless, I want to uh, correct that impression right now. We are very clear about this, that there are people bound and determined to kill us, and that the only way to deal with them is to kill or capture them and to be most aggressive about it. What we have tried to say is that you have this hardened, committed, zealous group of people that have to be dealt with in a, in a swift and clear manner. You have, however, a, a, a looming danger, which is the greater public support for this type of activity across the Muslim world. And we want to drive a wedge between the committed zealot murderer on the one hand and the person in the, living in the Muslim world who is right now much more sympathetic to Osama bin Laden than he is to George Bush. And that's wrong. I hear you. And, and, and so we cannot condemn, and we do not wish to condemn the entire Islamic world. We do not do that. The, the fact is that we are harmed and our national security is harmed when we have as little support as we have in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in Jordan, in Turkey of all places, in the, in, the, in the countries that have been a bulwark of support for us. We need them. We need their support for basing. We need their support for the education reforms we've talked about. We need their support for covert actions. We need their support for uh, sharing of information. We need them. And we need them to understand us. We need them to respect us. And so uh, this is difficult. It is not all one or the other. I just, I'm happy that, that you're, you've made it very clear the position of the commission. Um, the, the sad fact is that Saddam Hussein never thought we would remove him from Kuwait, or he never would have gone in. And he never thought we would do a regime change, or he would have cooperated. Uh, he never wanted to be hunted like an animal. He never wanted his kids killed. He never wanted his daughters in Jordan. We, we know that. He never thought we would attack him. He misread us twice, which strikes me that, that a deterrence that people don't think you're going to use becomes a, a meaningless instrument. And as a result, we've had a loss of life, I, a tremendous loss of lives. Uh, I'd like you to just speak on one issue. I have a red light, and I'll let members just come back with one or more question and then get to our next panel. But I do want you to tell me the pluses and minuses of your recognition that there is a way that we appeal to uh, people in the third world that's important, I would think. Schools, speeches, uh, I mean, forums come to the United States. But that generally appear in, impacts the elite within society, uh, those that those that, you know, basically have an opportunity to study in this country become the elite, let me put it that way. Uh, whereas the other approach is mass communication with, with the, the downtrodden who live there. Um, tell me the pluses and minuses of each. I'm, I know that you're suggesting we do both. Well, we're doing a less effective job on both at the moment. I mean, there's no... Again, I'll tell you, in my present role as a college president, we're getting less of those exchanges now than at any time in a long, long time. I mean, the future leaders of the world, we've benefited because they've come to this country for education, and for whatever reason, in the present atmosphere, decided not to come in very large numbers. And those people from Africa and Asia and a number of other places are finding other places to get their education. And I think that uh, will hurt us 
over the long, over the long haul. Uh, I, it's hard to differentiate between the two. Obviously, you've got to appeal to the educated people, the people who will be hopefully the future leaders of a country. And you do everything you can to appeal to them. One of the best ways was to getting them to see this country themselves and then go back and most of them understood the benefits of our society, our economy, and, and, and promoted it in their own country in various ways. Uh, but that does not come at the exclusion, particularly these days, of trying to communicate with, with, with larger numbers. And we have the ability to do that now. Uh, there's no reason Al Jazeera Al Jazeera should be Al Jazeera, excuse me, should be unchallenged. That there should be no other means of communication that these people hear in this part of the world. Uh, whether we fund part of that, whether we do it with a combination of others, but that shouldn't be unchallenged as a method of communication, particularly when what they put in the air is not in our interest. Uh, so. Yes, uh, I think we've got to do both. I mean, you, you, you can't just say, I think, deal with the elites, and you can't just say, deal with the masses. You've got to, you've got to, we have different ways of doing both, and I think your point is very, cor is, is correct. I mean, we, we've got to do it. Does any other member have a closing comment? I'm just uh, thinking that um, Mayor Lindsay, uh, who was losing the election, won the election when the Mets uh, won the World Series. I wonder the impact if the Iraqis get the gold medal. Would be nothing but good. It would probably be nothing but good. Do you have any uh, last, uh, is there any question we should have asked uh, that we didn't, any question that you prepared for that we should have uh, realized to have asked? Or any statement you want to make no, again? No, thank you. Thank you Let very much for the opportunity. Thank both of you for honoring this committee and all of Congress by your extensive uh, time spent with, uh, with uh, so many of us, it, it, it'll, it'll pay off. Your I, work I, will pay off and your work before us will pay off. As and well. we want to thank you and the Congress for coming back in these committees during the month of August. I know how extraordinary that is and I, I think when most of us in the Commission cheered the fact that you were willing to do that because of your understanding of the crisis this country is facing, I don't think members of the Commission realized that meant <laughs> we were going to be here in August too. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just ask you right now, though. Your staff members are no longer paid. Is that correct? That's correct. Because what we have one more hearing tomorrow, and we're asking, uh, we were asking a commission member, a staff member, uh, to come, and we realize they're out uh, around the countryside. But if you ha uh, find a staff member loitering around Washington, <laughs> hope you send them to our committee tomorrow. We'll do our best to get them here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you both very Thank much. You. We appreciate it a lot. The chair will recognize our next panel, thank them for their patience. Patricia uh, D. Stacy Harrison, Acting Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Department of State. Kenneth E. Tomlinson, Chairman, Broadcasting Board of Governors. Uh, Charles Trey Evers, the third Commissioner, Advisory Commission on Public Diplomacy. And Jesse T. Ford, Director, International Affairs and Trade, Government Accounting Office. Uh, recognize all four if they would remain standing and we will uh, swear them in. Just correct, it is Jess Ford, not Jesse Ford. I'm renaming a lot of people today. Thank you. If you'd raise your right hand, I'd like to swear you in. I ask, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Um, we'll start uh, with you, Madam Secretary. We appreciate uh, your um, being here today. Uh, we appreciate your service as acting uh, secretary on two occasions here now. Um, it's, uh, we, we, uh, we just know that uh, a lot of work is required, and, and thank you for that. And thank all the other witnesses as well. So 
You have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Shays, members of the committee. I'm really. I don't think your mic is on, Madam Secretary. Is that it? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Just do me a favor, and I'll start you over. Just t tap the, the. Yeah, it's on. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're, f you're fine. Start all over again. Clock starts over. Well, first, I, I do want to thank all of you for this opportunity. I can't think of anything more important that we could be doing today. Mr. Chairman, my written statement for the record provides a comprehensive report on public diplomacy initiatives since September 11th. And with your permission, I will just make a few brief remarks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. The recommendations of the September 11th Commission underscore challenges to public diplomacy as we seek to engage with audiences in the Arab and Muslim world. The Commission calls upon us to define our message, to take a strong stand in support of a better future, to defend our ideas, ideals, and values, and to offer opportunity to youth. I agree strongly with these recommendations. Following the attack on our country, we began to execute a public diplomacy strategy that aligns with these directives with the understanding, as Dr. Rice said recently, there is much more that must be done. We have accelerated our effort to communicate with and engage Arab and Muslim audiences, advocating both values and policy, affirming what we have in common and the mutual benefit of working together for peace, prosperity, and freedom. The essence of America's message to the world is the hope implicit in our commitment to individual freedom, the non-negotiable demands of human dignity, and economic opportunity. And despite the negative polls, we find that these values resonate. They are enduring especially with the young and important and rapidly growing demographic. Our missions abroad are actively engaged in advocating values and policy through a wide variety of programs tailored to specific cultures and taking into account the way people receive or trust information. We are working more closely than ever with USAID to ensure recipients of our assistance recognize that this help does come from the American people. And the new policy coordinating committee on Muslim outreach, which I co-chair with the NSC, will further strengthen coordination with DOD and other agencies. As we work within an environment of instant global communication, we are using all the tools of technology through the internet, television, print and broadcast, video and film. And I'm very pleased to be here today with Ken Tomlinson. The BBG, under his leadership, has been vigorous and creative. Through Radio Sawa and El Hara TV, we are reaching increasingly larger audiences with the preeminent mass media channels of radio and television. The Department's Bureau of International Information Programs, through its expanded web presence, utilizes the other critical channel of mass media, the internet, and also helps us connect at a grassroots level through American Corners. The Bureau of Public Affairs has expanded its outreach to new media outlets to connect, to inform, and counter disinformation within a 24-7 global news cycle, and is increasing journalist tours to expose influential professionals to American life in all of its diversity. Through exchange programs, we are reaching younger and more diverse audiences, and we have refocused our programs to engage a group I called youth influencers, university professors, classroom teachers, clerics, ministers of education, journalists, community leaders. Almost three years ago, we launched Partnerships for Learning it's a collaborative effort with men and women from the region who want to work with us on behalf of the successor generation, many of whom lack a solid education and they face a future of chronic unemployment and underemployment. 
Partnerships for Learning is delivering hope and opportunity through Fulbright and other scholarships, through exchanges and English teaching. We have just completed the first year of our country's first ever government-sponsored high school program with the region, more than a dozen Muslim countries. And we did this with the support of hundreds of Muslim American host families. And may I just interject that at a time when the polls, this tsunami of polling is so negative, we have families in these countries on a waiting list who desperately want to send their young people to our country for one full year to interact with Americans and have a little bit more opportunity for their own future. And in fact, we know that one of the greatest assets in public diplomacy is the American people themselves. Through our partnership with the private sector, which includes a network of more than 1,500 organizations and 80,000 volunteers who welcome and host thousands of people from other countries to the United States, we are communicating values in the most direct and enduring way. Within the Department of State, we have taken steps to strengthen coordination of public diplomacy and have sent to Congress notification of our intent to establish an Office of Policy Planning and Resources in the Office of the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. There are many lessons that we are still learning from September 11th, but one overarching theme remains. Getting our message out in words and images is only part of the job. We must commit to working in partnership with the vast majority of people who want a better future for themselves and their children. Commission member John Lehman is right. Soft options are as important as the hard ones. In both peaceful times and times of conflict, our mission is to ensure a positive, vigorous American presence in the world, declaring our policies, demonstrating and communicating our values, forging links of mutual understanding and respect between peoples on a continuous and sustained basis. This is not the work of weeks or months. It is the work of years and generations. And the mission of soft power is a vital part, not only of our homeland security, but everyone's homeland, everyone's security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tomlinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Kucinich, members of the committee. We thank you so much for this important hearing on the 9-11 Commission recommendations on public diplomacy. Um, earlier this year, with the enthusiastic support of President Bush and members of Congress, the Broadcasting Board of Governors launched Al Hura, the free one, our new 24-hour day Arabic language television network. Through direct-to-home satellite communications and terrestrial transmission to Iraq, we are able to broadcast directly to the people of the Middle East over five time zones in 22 countries, from Morocco to Iraq to Yemen. Our broadcast will not overnight eliminate the effects of generations of intellectual isolation and neglect so vividly outlined in the classic uh, UN report, uh, 2003, the report on, on uh, knowledge dissemination in the Arab world. In contemplating what we have to overcome, uh, to establish real and, and substantive dialogue with our neighbors in the Arab world, it's daunting to consider the fact that the aggregate of Western books translated into Arabic since the dawn of publishing amounts to little more than 10,000 books, equivalent to what Spain translates in a single year. Indeed, the United Nations report concluded that what we have to overcome in the region is the absence of a strategic vision that provides a solid foundation for knowledge dissemination through education, media, publishing and translation. The knowledge base for the people in the Arab world is further limited by the indisputable fact that the news and information they have received from several popular satellite televisions, uh, outlets like Al Jazeera, have given them a picture of the world which is frequently distorted by institutional prejudices and sensationalism. Against this backdrop, consider what the people in the Arab world have been able to watch in recent weeks on Al Hura television. For three consecutive days last week, Al Hura broadcast live sessions of the Iraqi National Congress in Baghdad. Iraqis observed their representatives freely debating the future of their nation, democracy in action, in stark contrast to the repression they had experienced before. These broadcasts were not restricted to the people of Iraq. Throughout the Arab world, 
people were able to see that freedom and democracy can exist within a Muslim country, that universal values can be embraced by Muslim uh, uh, societies. Daily talk shows on Al Hira, which present points of view across the political spectrum, including positions unsympathetic to our own, mean that for the first time people in the Arab world see, hear, and participate, uh, participate in the foundations of democracy. We present, you decide. Al Hura is helping to frame the debate and the focus on issues uh, facing this region. We will not win every argument on, on every political talk show, but as President Bush has said time and again, in the long run, truth is on our side. Moreover, we believe the very existence of free-flowing debate on Al Hura will encourage people to demand free and open and objective presentations on indigenous Arab, uh, Arab outlets throughout the, that region. Consider the, effect, the effects of in-depth Al Hura coverage of the, of the uh, genocide in the Darfur region of the, Sudan, of the Sudan. Long before the world had come to focus on this tragedy, Al Hura reporting teams were on the scene, which led other Arab media outlets to follow suit and make the events of Darfur a, a matter of serious concern to all people. The ability to debunk anti-American conspiracy theories by credible Arab thinkers uh, alone is worth the price of U.S. financed uh, satellite broadcasting. The truth is on our side. In the midst of all this broadcasting, it is critical uh, that accuracy be our standard. The people of the region aren't stupid. If we're slanting the news, they'll figure it out. But if we establish long-term credibility on these broadcasts, people will begin asking questions. What went wrong? What slowed the development of a civilization that was once far ahead of the West? What are the factors behind the crushing absence of economic opportunity for youth in the Arab world? And we will be there to answer them. Let me turn to Radio Sawa briefly. To me, the most striking success of Sawa has been the widespread acceptance of Sawa news and public affairs programming as credible. Uh, we realize the draw to this youth-oriented station is, is popular music. Uh, and, and when we started, people said they'll never listen to your news and they'll never take it seriously. Well, according to surveys conducted earlier this year by A.C. Nielsen, Radio Sawa was found to be a reliable source of news and information by 73% of its weekly uh, listenership. In an era when Arab youth systematically boycott American products, uh, they not only have widely accepted U.S. sponsored uh, entertainment radio, they've accepted its news as accurate and, and dependable. I do want to pay tribute to my fellow board member, Democrat Norman Paddits, the father of Radio Sawa, and an irrepressible force for international broadcasting. Thanks to his spirit and a dedicated core of journalists led by news director Muafa Harb, Radio Sawa has made, has made a truly historic breakthrough in the Middle East. And Mr. Chairman, we deeply appreciate the favorable, favorable focus on what we've been doing in the 9-11 Commission report. The report said, uh, recognizing that Arab and Muslim audiences rely on satellite television and radio, the government has begun, has begun some promising initiatives in television and radio broadcasting for the Arab world, Iran, Afghanistan. These efforts are beginning to reach large audiences. The Broadcasting Board of Governors has asked for much larger resources. It should get them. We're currently working with the administration on potential radio and television strategies that will give us the same type of impact in the non-Arabic-speaking Muslim world as we're having in the Arabic-speaking Muslim world. We've made a good start. In Iran, we built on the popularity of, of, on the popularity of VOA radio with a new 24-7 radio fired off for the youth which combines the talents of... I mean, we support Israel because we have a special relationship with them, a moral obligation to see them succeed. They're one of the only democracies in the area. They're a huge ally of ours. And it is our policy, I believe, is the right policy. But you would not find a terrible lot of Arab Muslims that would agree with us on that. And so it is the right thing for us to continue to talk about that. But it is a very hard obstacle for us to get over um, because they do not believe like we do on, on that. We had the first president, Republican or Democrat, ever to call for a Palestine, Palestinian state. You've got um, Ariel Sharon, who's calling to move, move settlements and being attacked by his own party for doing so. Um, but yet, we don't really get credit for any of that. B but the answer is yes, it's very hard um, sometimes with our policies, whether you agree or disagree with them. If the people you're talking to don't agree with them, it's hard to get through that. I don't have much to say about the policy end, but I, I can't say that um, 
I think that our, our research indicates that we, we can do a better job of um, touting uh, uh, things that we're doing that are positive in nature. When, when we uh, did a survey for our, uh, last year in Egypt, for example, we found many Egy Egyptians were not aware of the sizable amount of foreign aid that we provide to that country, and we've been providing it for, for two decades now. Uh, so I think there are things that we can do to, to uh, better um, uh, show some of the positive things that we're doing out there. I know in the case of AID, they have some uh, restrictions on what they can do, but I, there, there's room for improvement in those areas. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Do any of you have anything you would like to add in, in closing from the discussion? If not, we'll, we thank you. For thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your participation. We'll, we'll turn then to our next panel, uh, panel number three. Uh, it will include uh, Keith Reinhardt, who's the President, Business. Thank you. For Diplomatic Action, Chairman DDB Worldwide, he's accompanied by Gary Nell, President and CEO, Sesame Workshop. Uh, also, we'll hear testimony from Charlotte Beers, former Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, Department of State. Also, we'll have testimony from Dr. Rhonda S. Saharna, Associate Professor of Public Communication, American University. And also, we have testimony from Hafiz al murazi Bureau Chief, Al Jazeera, Washington Office. Mr. Beers, would you? I think the order is in the way we called them. So it's starting with Secretary Beers on this side over here. Is this my corner? Yeah, yeah. Actually, you're going to be. Is that right? Well, for our panelists, as our chairman has stated, we do swear in our witnesses uh, for these hearings. So if you'd please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? The testimony you give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please note for the record that the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We'll begin with uh, Charlotte Beers. Thank you. This is my first hearing as a private sector person. I've got a green light. Can you hear me? Yeah, just move it a little closer. What? The green light was fine. It's just a little closer if you could. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think public diplomacy has kind of had um, a diminishing in terms of the people's perception of what it means, not only in our own press, but in our government and our, maybe in, in our country. It has a connotation of propaganda, which in this country is sometimes very negative. It can be seen as a pitch, an example of arrogant advocacy. And what I like so much about the opportunity of being here today is that uh, you have really raised the eyes off that page and described and defined the job in a much more um, comprehensive way. It's worth repeating. You have asked us to consider something no less than moral leadership, a demonstration of generosity and caring, to defend and define our core values, and to create an environment for moderates for reform and freedom. That's all. That's a pretty big job. Uh, but I have a feeling that the American people are hoping we can pull this off and would approve of these goals because it's time for us to think of ourselves as bridge builders as well as all the other facets of who we are in the world. But because we've been so isolated and because our enemies are seen as heroes in the countries in the Middle East, I think we have to start with a modest goal. Commi you ask often, what is the message? And I think that the, the beginning of the communication effort has to be only a simple goal of mutual understanding. That's the place we have to start. And then we can advance to those subjects on which we can agree. The end result of that will promote national interest, but you can't start the other way around because it's just there's not enough humility in it. Uh, the message 
the message has to be words verified by deeds and programs and experiences, people to people, over time and consistently, which is not easy to do and is not anything we've done in the recent past. The elements of the strategy, as far as I'm concerned, is that the core values are crucial and it's very fascinating to me that a number of the core values we rate tops are shared by Arab and Muslim families and they would be stunned to hear it. And as conflicted as they are about the United States, they are very openly eager to learn science, to, to give us credit for math expertise, to take English because it's the language of the computer world. So we have plenty of opportunities. The problem is we're not equipped today to deliver on these kind of large-scale tasks. I personally think it's, it's, there's a clear problem in not having a central leadership. I felt it greatly when I'm I was... I'm sorry, not having a what? A central leadership to guide as, as a team the strategic direction of, of public diplomacy and then have the power to cause it to happen in all the constituencies. There's not a company in the world who would agree to run fragmented businesses without a central leadership, and any time they did, they got in terrible trouble. We have too many uneven and diverse messages taking place, sometimes quite inadvertently. There's a dearth of skills in the State Department and in some of our other efforts to do modern communication content and delivery and research. I mean, it's, research is not poll taking. Research is a very sophisticated game done by experts that understand insight, feelings, emotions, and content, and can help predict attitudes and then behavior. So it's not a game for people who don't really understand how to do it, and you're asking us to consider measurement. And that's a very important aspect to it. The purpose of all of these kinds of skills is to build relationships that will last longer than any foreign policy issue. So they are absolutely crucial to our well-being. Now, with the very best of intentions, it seems to me that USIA's integration into state has caused certain aspects of that organization to be weakened. It has limited its ability to adapt, to take initiatives, and to create new solutions. Even with Secretary Powell's clear support it has been difficult to get new initiatives and follow through and separate funding for work we need to do to answer those goals you've laid out. The public diplomacy field staff often reports to three different bosses because the structure has been cobbled together. And most of those bosses are focused on traditional diplomacy. There is little training. The first annual meeting of the public diplomacy field staff was the first year that I was in that office and it was a very controversial decision. They had never come together. And you can't bring in new people, as we could have done, because the security clearances in the State Department are so difficult. It's not really a lack of goodwill. It is simply divergent task. The tra traditional diplomacy, which I'm calling the main work of the State Department, has exceptionally qualified people who are creating a vital dialogue with our key governments. They interpret and define with their counterparts the very meaning and context of foreign policy. It's hard to imagine a more important job, but it is by its definition discreet, slow-moving, and secretive. On the other hand, public diplomacy makes this group of people quite nervous. It's very public. It is, its job is to engage a whole bunch of people with widely diverse interests and topics and we're after long-term relationships that have emotional, intangible subjects such as religion and trust and freedom involved. Given the totally different task that traditional diplomacy um, and, and public diplomacy have, it's hard to see that this is the right place for you to take us to task for all kinds of, of what you call reinvigoration under the present structure at the very least. Now, there is a lot we have to work with. I mean, you can't listen to that last panel without being, um, I think, admiring of the work that's gone forward 
in terms of all of the public diplomacy efforts that are taking place at state in terms of these new adventures and also at the BBG. But the thing, and we learn from the exchanges, we know that anyone who comes to the United States has a transforming experience here, but there's only 25,000 of them a year, and we have to deal with the issue of scale. If we do not take this story and our ability to cause exchanges with one another to the countries in large enough numbers to make a difference, I don't think we can answer the request for the job description you laid out. So it isn't enough to, to just expand the programs that we have. You're going to hear some very interesting stories about the private sector. And I think that somehow the public diplomacy center that you will eventually, I hope, devise will need to be very powerful partners with the private sector. You can't expect them to get this done without that kind of um, important arm in the service. We have in the United States amazing musicians, athletes, teachers, business people who will be very interested in going to do their part. They are willing to go to countries to stay there to teach, to take part in much more complicated ways than we've ever devised, but we don't have the means, the fund, or the system to activate them. But there's a lot of that work done on a small basis today in the State Department. There are charming and efficient ways to teach science, computer skills, and English on the local TV channels in the key countries. <coughs> There are Department of American Studies that we could ask universities throughout the Middle East to take. Our own Library of Congress has the largest collection of Arab books in the world. Why aren't we translating those, putting them beside a comparable American history, and putting that in an American Studies class? Think how many people would come through there as compared to the painstaking one person at a time contact that we have been doing in the past. It's possible digita digitally to connect a teen in Idaho with a teen in Cairo. It is possible to take partnerships with local TV and radio stations in these country and run stories about what USAID is doing. The reason the people in Egypt don't know about the programs is per practically everyone agreed that we wouldn't tell them. And USAID, when asked to take part in communicating the brand, the United States, said we have no people or mandate to do that. But in spite of that, they've done some impressive co-programming with local TV shows in the country to say, look, here's this little brand new water system we have in Cairo, which has li literally transformed a region of that city. <clears throat> it's unacceptable, I think, to be silent about American generosity. We could do much more innovative things if we felt free to take the initiative. It's possible to make a virtual reality room where we build not a library, which is kind of old form, frankly, or an American corner, but we create one in a virtual reality. We make it so much fun to go into, and we put it in a shopping mall in Rabat. And at one time, we had the Smithsonian Institute working on that sort of thing. So I, I'm actually... Secretary Beers, we're, we're going to need you to, uh, to stop. wrap up your... Or just sorry. conclude your comments. Okay. I, uh, may I conclude? Thank you for signaling me. This is the danger of being enthusiastic and running amok. <laughs> we love it. Yeah, we love it. Yeah. Um, one thing I don't want to leave without saying, please don't buy the idea that the United States can't be the messenger. We do not have a choice. There are ways that smart, talented people can get that across. And furthermore, we can't afford to stand for just foreign policy and military might. Thank you very much. Mr. Reinhardt. Sorry, guys, I took your time. Uh, Mr. Reinhardt, if you'd turn your microphone on, please, at the bottom. Part of public diplomacy so we can hear you. <laughs> Hi. How's this? Better? Did you hear my thank you? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman Shays, members of the subcommittee. Thanks for inviting me here today. It's an honor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, brought a few slides to help me uh, summarize my very long written testimony. Uh, so, DJ, if we're ready back there. Let me begin with a statement you included in your invitation. 
If the United States does not act aggressively to define itself in the Islamic world, the extremists will gladly do it for us. I respectfully suggest that we step back a bit and view the Middle East as part of a much larger problem. The problem of America's reputation is not confined to the Islamic world, which means it would not be wrong to paraphrase the Commission's statement. If the United States does not act quickly and intelligently to define itself in the post-9-11 world, our detractors across the globe will do it for us. Two recent, if small, examples were this illustration on the front page of the German edition of the Financial Times and this image from Middle East Online just last uh. Friday. I claim no expertise in government or foreign policy, but as a concerned U.S. citizen and international businessman, I enlisted some of the most preeminent professionals in the fields of global communications, marketing, research, and media to form Business for Diplomatic Action, a nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization whose purpose is to mobilize and harness the private sector in a separate but parallel effort to augment whatever the government is doing to reverse the alarming decline in America's reputation. Let me be clear, this effort is not about ads or selling. BDA does not stand for Business for Diplomatic Advertising. It stands for Diplomatic Action. Because my background is uh, advertising, I frequently take these paddles with me to remind <laughs> it's not about ads, it's about actions. Because listening, is the most important part of any communications process, and not, by the way, an attribute uh, normally associated with Americans. The first brief we gave to ourselves was a line from the Scottish poet, a oh, would that God the gift might give us to see ourselves as others see us. And our listening confirmed that the image of America, as you know, is a montage of our foreign policy, our global brands, and our entertainment product. It's a mixture we sometimes refer to as a rummy and coke with Madonna on the side. Should there be any doubt that government and commercial actions are inextricably linked, one need only to review the political cartoons in the foreign press the day after Saddam was toppled. A careful analysis of all our listening efforts revealed four important root causes for the rise in anti-American sentiment around the world. U.S. foreign policy, as we've been discussing. But there are others, the effects of globalization, so many people feeling left out or left behind, the pervasiveness of American popular culture and our collective personality. BDA believes that an activated U.S. business community can effectively address the last three. This slide shows some of the most prominent positives and negatives that we have found in how others see us. And to paraphrase Johnny Mercer, we see BDA's job then as one of accentuating the positive and eliminating the negative. To do both means engaging people in both the United States and abroad. Let me just touch on a few projects we have underway. PepsiCo has paid for the initial distribution of this little World Citizen's Guide to uh, the 200,000 young Americans who will study abroad next semester. The content was provided by respondents in 130 uh, countries. We asked for advice for Americans traveling abroad. The response was robust, candid, and prescriptive. Uh, this little booklet, in a, uh, an advanced copy we've given you, uh, is not a travel guide for young Amer Americans. Rather, it's a compendium of insights that arouse their interest in the world and move them a little closer to a global mindset. This page says it might be better if you uh, don't compare everything we do here in this country to how it is back home in America. And we also plan an abridged version of the uh, guide for 50 to 60 million Americans who travel outside the United States each year. Everyone acknowledges the importance of exchange programs. We hope to find new ways of bringing the value of these programs to life and share them with mainstream mass audiences. One approach to this notion is a treatment we've developed for a reality show, featuring interns uh, from Iran, perhaps, working inside a U.S. multinational corporation here, and then Americans interning in foreign offices of the same multinational. 
in the final episode, the CEO of that company may even say, you're hired. Now to the Middle East, uh, I, I am bothered by the emphasis on exporting American values. Uh, these people have values of their own. And as Secretary Beers said, we can connect with some shared values. I agree with a witness who uh, was uh, formerly with the Reader's Digest, or at least I agree with their old headline writer's rule, which said, always start where the reader is. Don't start where you are. Um, in the Middle East especially, we need messages that inspire hope and promise to youth at a very early age. Gary Nell, president and CEO of Sesame Workshop, is an active BDA board member. He's here with me today. He has vast experience in enabling locally produced children's programming, uh, especially in the Arab world. I know you'll have questions for him. This is an activity BDA is supporting. Although you may be anxious to create effective messages from the U.S. government to the Middle East, I respectfully suggest that even with careful planning, such efforts at this time are likely to meet with failure. Based on everything we know and hear from the region, the U.S. government is simply not a credible messenger. The implication for this committee, Mr. Chairman, is to guide the U.S. government to give real support and incentives to empower and activate credible messengers who can begin the process of bridge building, even as the government embraces and enacts previous recommendations to dramatically overhaul the management of our public diplomacy efforts. Uh, other BDA projects are included in your handout. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in crafting a response to the challenge posed by 9-11 Commission, a BDA would recommend you use the same strategy development process that we in the marketing world use for any major global brand in trouble or any company being attacked by a competitor wishing to destroy it or diminish it. The process is outlined in my written testimony. I provided one uh, of the uh, representative worksheets from that uh, process for your consideration. I'd like to close uh, my remarks with a simple way to portray the state of America's reputation and a way we might think about it. This is the uh, sigmoid curve. Uh, we often use it to diagram the life of a product or a corporation or our careers or our very lives. Uh, we wobble a bit getting started, then we flourish and grow, and then at the end of the life cycle, we start to wane again. The good news is that for organizations, states, and reputations, there is life beyond the curve if we are smart enough, astute enough to start a new curve. The integrity of the organization or nation for that matter is maintained by making sure that core values are preserved, perhaps, perhaps even re-emphasized as a new curve begins. But not everything stays the same. Typically, what got you from A to B will not get you from B to C. In the business world, the nature of the competition may have changed. In our larger world, the nature of our struggle has changed. At the risk of oversimplifying, it seems to me that while in the years preceding 9-11, we could lead the world by force, in the days to come, we must learn to lead the world by influence and example. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Business for Diplomatic Action stands ready to help in whatever way we can. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Saharna. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it on? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you for keeping the spotlight on public diplomacy. I think it's going to lead the way to making not only America but the world a lot safer. Sir, you asked us to step back and to view the 9-11 Commission's recommendation within the larger picture. This oral statement provides a brief snapshot. The written statement for the record provides what I see in more detail. First, the reviews of American public diplomacy over the past three years, including the recent 9-11 Commission report, pin America's communication problem on lack of strategy. They say America needs a strategy so it can focus its message, coordinate efforts, and measure results. Sir, when communication lacks a strategy, the results tend to be random. You win some, you lose some, hit or miss. 
American public diplomacy, on the other hand, has had a fairly pronounced losing streak. That strongly suggests a strategy. Second, stepping back and looking at the larger picture, the strategy is clear. Since the terrorist attack, America has aggressively pursued an information battle strategy borrowed from the Cold War. The national security strategy put the war of ideas second to the military war. The battle for the hearts and minds has been a charge reverberating through the political halls of Washington to the front pages of hometown newspapers. The 9-11 Commission echoed that strategy. Just as we did in the Cold War, we need to defend our ideas abroad vigorously. Three, fighting an information battle was ideally suited for the Cold War era. Then you had two identifiable government powers dominating the political as well as the communication landscape. The bipolar context inherently defied the messages. Us versus them had persuasive power. Governments could control information. Foreign and domestic audiences were separated by a notion that technology struggled to cross. Public diplomacy was a product made in America and shipped overseas. Achieving information dominance was key to silencing the opponent. In an information battle, the one with the most information wins. For fighting an information battle has become the equivalent of conventional warfare. The strategy lacks the agility and effectiveness to navigate today's dynamic political and communication terrain. The bipolar political context has proliferated it into a multipolar one. Culture has replaced nationalism as the prevailing dynamic, filtering and distorting even the best message that America can design. Regional conflicts, once masked by the superpower rivalry, have surfaced with a vengeance. For the public's absorbed in these conflicts, American policy is the message of American public diplomacy. America's domestic and foreign publics have become one 24-7 global audience. Today, communication is about exchanging information. In a world suffering from information overload, disseminating information is spam. Networking is strategic. American, finally, American public diplomacy needs to switch its strategic focus. Forget battles, think bridges. To win hearts and minds, American public diplomacy needs to bridge the perception gap between Americans and foreign public. Disseminating information cannot do this. Building bridges can. Aggressively pursued, this strategy can cross the political and cultural hurdles. The strategy of building bridges is not new. The Fulbright Program, the Peace Corps, represent America's long tradition of building bridges. What is new is the strategic power of this technique. Building bridges networking underlines the growing influence of non-state actors. A woman in Maine began with the idea that led to the campaign to, bland, to ban landmines. She received the Nobel Peace Award. A man in a cave in Afghanistan had another idea. As the 9-11 Commission so thoroughly detailed, Al-Qaeda is also a network. In yesterday's information battle, the one with the most information won. Today, the one with the strongest and most extensive network wins. Achieving this strategic goals requires new tactics to identify potential links, create relationships, and forge a network. My written statement outlines some of these tactics. Undoubtedly, there are more. Communication research also has emerged to measure the quality of relationships. The quality of America's political relationships impacts America's image. Using these new research tools will help measure American public diplomacy effectiveness more accurately and meaningfully. In its recommendation, the 9-11 Commission began with the call for institutionalizing imagination. For American public diplomacy to be as effective as it was, as it, for American public diplomacy to be as effective in the war on terrorism as it was during the Cold War, America needs to imaginatively explore a new strategic focus. To win the hearts and minds, America needs to forget the battles 
and think bridges. Sir, before I close, I must recognize a communication professional who took the reign of American public diplomacy during extraordinary circumstances and led with extraordinary vision and energy. Thank you, Under Secretary Beers. And Representative Shea, I thank you for your continued pursuit to improve American public diplomacy and urging this on the committee. Your trip last week is the epitome of building bridges, as was your work in the Peace Corps. It's a strategic direction that holds the promise for as the 9-11 committee advocated making America safer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Amorati. Mr. Chairman uh, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for this opportunity to talk to you today about the 9-11 Commission report's recommendations on public diplomacy. I'm glad that the Arab media is being included in the discussion of what should be done instead of being excluded and blamed for bringing bad news. This hearing reflects a sincere attempt to diagnose the nature of the problem instead of finding a scapegoat for the challenges the U.S. faces today in the Middle East. And as they say, diagnosis is half the treatment. Sometimes it's easier to talk about what is not the problem. There is a general misconception that the Arab media and the Al Jazeera in particular that I represent here is a major cause of the rising anti-American sentiment in the Arab and Muslim world. By the way, there is an interesting parallel in that many Arabs and Muslims blame the U.S. media for reinforcing anti-Islamic sentiment and negative perceptions of Arabs and Muslims. But I believe neither is the case. A recent Zagbi International poll of 3,300 adult Arabs in six Arab countries shows that Arabs who have been to the U.S. who know Americans or who have learned about the U.S. from watching U.S. television are as angry with U.S. foreign policy and they have nearly as unfavorable attitudes toward the U.S. as those who have no such direct experience. Media or medium, I don't think, is the main reason. The work of Professor Shibli Talhami of the University of Maryland has also clearly shown that Arab media, exactly if we would like to criticize, like the American media, is more market-driven than commonly understood, that it does not shape opinion as such as it reflects it and responds to it. So as most experts in the Arab world agree, the main problem is not the media. It is U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East that is the main source and cause of anti-American sentiment in the region, in my view, as well. Unfortunately, post-9-11 U.S. policies did not alleviate the existing problem, but instead exacerbated it. Before the invasion of Iraq, the U.S. was criticized for its perceived role in supporting Israel's occupation of Palestinian territories. Now, the U.S. is widely perceived in the Arab world as itself the occupying power of yet another Arab Muslim population, the Iraqis. We're dealing here with perceptions. The U.S. has also been criticized in the Arab world for its business as usual policy with certain authoritarian Arab dictators while promoting regime change in certain others. The wars in Afghanistan and Iraq did nothing to change this view because the U.S. is now seen as replacing defiant dictators with compliant, if not puppet, regimes. All the efforts to improve U.S. standing in the Muslim world, short of making policy changes, are unlikely to succeed. In fact, as the 9-11 Commission report states, favorable rating of the U.S. have dramatically decreased in some Muslim countries. For example, and as it was mentioned here today as well, the report says that favorable ratings for the U.S. in Indonesia have gone from 61% after 9-11 to 15% just the last summer. And by the way, Indonesia is not an Arabic-speaking country, so we cannot blame it on the Arabic language Al Jazeera. Today's hearing is titled Defending Ideals and Defining the Message. Assuming that one of America's most cherished ideas, 
and the ideals is that of a non-government controlled and independent press. How can you promote this ideal amongst Arab using a government sponsored, funded, and controlled medium such as Al Hurra TV? You don't need to reinvent the wheel by creating a new medium that is inherently compromised by its self-serving goals, at least in the eyes of the Arabs. To give you a good example, two years ago, the Israeli government launched an Arabic language television channel, Satellite, Channel 33, in an attempt to convey its message to the Arab world. It was a complete failure, and they ended up going back to speaking through the Arab media outlets that already exists and that already had the trust of their viewers. It's worth noting here that Al Jazeera still routinely interviews Israeli officials and commentators. As for defining the message, in this age of globalization, media proliferation, and the internet, you can no longer distinguish between traditional and public diplomacy. Nor can you distinguish between domestic and international discourse. Any remarks made in a press conference or in a congressional hearing, just like ours here, instantly reach the very audience you think you have time to tailor a specific message for them. Rhetoric is instantly available and disseminated the second it's uttered, whether by a mullah speaking from a mosque in Tehran or by a decorated U.S. general speaking from a, uh, from a church in a small town America. And we should remind ourselves that the airwaves are just as full of anti-Muslim sentiment as anti-American sentiment. I would also like to interject here that General Boykin's anti-Islamic remarks were first broadcast by NBC, and that the first photos of Abu Ghraib prison were broadcast by CBS, both US networks, not Arabs, not Al Jazeera. In summary, given these inherent problems with the whole concept of a public diplomacy, it's understandable that it's difficult to keep the position of an Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy filled. Not even the best advertising executives can help you market a product that serves you and not the consumer. If U.S. policymakers are confident that their policies in the Middle East are the right ones and do not need to be changed, then they should not be surprised at negative reaction to these policies. Just as U.S. officials and policymakers make the rounds of U.S. networks every Sunday in order to explain their policies to the American audience, they should do the same with the Arab networks, as I believe should members of Congress that I invite on a daily basis to be on Al Jazeera and to speak to our audience. This kind of routine interaction with the already established and trusted Arab media will allow these officials to both explain the policies and instantly gauge the reactions to them. This kind of engagement over the long term might lead to the positive changes so desperately needed on both sides. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We'll go to 10-minute rounds of questions, and we'll start with our chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank our last speaker for being here. I think this is the second time he's testified before this committee. Um, I'm not all that aware of what members um, uh, Al Jazeera uh, has. Uh, is, do you tend to kind of focus on the Senate and then get a distorted view, or do you invite members of Congress to also <laughs> participate? No, we, we, we invite all, of all and uh, your office. We have made many requests. Um, unsuccessfully, we could not get you on Al Jazeera, and we still we are renewing the, the, the request for all of you. Yeah. I, I was going to ask that question with that in mind because uh, I honestly don't know um, when we've been asked, and um, I, I would like to, to make sure that you call me personally because um, uh, I, I would like to have the opportunity to be on Al Jazeera. I appreciate um, that. Um, for a variety of reasons. That, and one of the things that's very clear to me is that, um, in a sense, uh, we're doing the reverse of what <laughs> we sometimes uh, don't like about the Europeans. We, we've set up a government uh, business can, to compete with the private sector. Is Al Jazeera owned privately, or is it owned by a government as well? No, Al Jazeera is uh, similar to the BBC, uh, in which it's uh, a public corporation. It receives the grants and funds from the state of Qatar, uh, and, but it's had its, its own independent board of directors 
that they set their policies so does, regardless. Does it have a p advertising as well? Yes, yeah. we do so have advertisement, and right. we were hoping uh, and, uh, when Al Jazeera was launched that only for five years would receive public grants, and after that we would be like CNN, right. uh, relying on our own. But unfortunately, Al Jazeera found out that most of the people who uh, fought against Al Jazeera in the Middle East, Arab regimes who didn't like Al Jazeera bringing dissidents uh, to speak over there or human rights activists to talk about human rights abuses, they, uh, in addition to the political pressure they tried to apply on the government of Qatar unsuccessfully, they found it easier to apply the pressure on their own advertisers. So most of advertisers would be very intimidated and reluctant to advertise on Al Jazeera because of their government. Uh, uh, being angry at Al Jazeera. Right. Um, what would any of you, and Mr. Nell, please feel free to participate. You didn't have an open statement, but we welcome your participation as well. What would any of you, uh, is there anything that was said by another panelist that you would disagree with and what would want to just make a, a contrasting point? I would, um, I, I think uh, Secretary Beers and I may have a disagreement on the uh, point about credibility of the messenger. Okay. And um, I so would... So maybe you could elaborate what you mean and then... Yes. Um, we, the um, the uh, testimony that was uh, given by the... Um, by the, uh, the report of the Subcommittee on Public-Private Partnerships and Public Diplomacy last June and the statement in that uh, testimony says that um, in many cases and situations, non-governmental actors may be better placed to achieve a given impact than the government. It goes on for a paragraph, but uh, it says government policies and uh, resource allocations for public diplomacy should explicitly address and embrace programs that provide incentives to private sector organizations uh, to perform tasks which the direct and obvious engagement of the government would be counterproductive. Uh, someone mentioned a... Uh, that seems like a reasonable statement. You disagree with that? No, 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 no. That was Ms. Beer's statement, Secretary Beer's statement, correct? No, you, this was, this was a statement of the Ian Davis Committee saying that the government is not, at this moment, a credible uh, messenger. Uh, Fawaz Jurgis, who's the uh, uh, Middle East expert uh, Muslim uh, professor at Sarah Lawrence uh, said uh, Arabs and Muslims are deeply attracted to and fascinated with the American idea. But he goes on to say, in the last few years, so much focus has been on foreign relations and on the opposing relations between the United States and the Arab world. So I'm just trying to understand that. What, where is the disagreement that... She is saying that, that the government is a credible messenger at this time, and I was... No, I'm not saying that. Okay. No, no, you have to, you have, one, one sec, one sec, one sec, one sec. <laughs> Secretary Beers, I, I want to just understand, and then you'll have plenty of time. Okay. And, and I realize this is a comment among friends, oh, yes, for the most yes. part, um, and, and people of respect of each other. I just, what I'm trying to understand is, I'm trying to figure this all out, and it would help me to know where there might even be subtle differences, and you can explain what you were, what you were saying. And then okay. Ms. Zah 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 the, <clears throat> the, um, uh, someone, uh, So what's your position? Just tell me your My position, position is that the government at this point of time is not a credible messenger to the Middle East and would be uh, better advised to provide incentives to other actors, as the previous testimony yes. said. And what would your position be, Secretary Beers? Uh, well, we went through this experience with shared values, which is a series of many documentaries. And the only place we've tested it in the form that Keith and I would both agree is substantially well researched. The process went like this. We, people were able to see these stories about Muslims in America five or six times. And in the first wave of exposure, they said, I don't believe you. And it's a one-sided discussion, very skeptical. By the second viewing, they were in love with the baker, who was one of the candidates, and a, and a young woman who was a TV star in America. After a bit, they found out that the baker was actually coming to their country to speak. And it shifted the gears a lot for them, even though they didn't go to the meeting. And in the final debate, the attitude about the United States and its anti-Muslim 
uh, theory was completely diverted. Now, and not by every single person who saw it. And this was a government presentation. And it was clearly, although we said it's from the it's from the U.S. government and the people of the United States, because we're from the State Department, we have to explain everything. And um, what I found that was a very artificial situation. And what I think is important is is to understand that underpinning two things, underpinning all of the rhetoric about the United States is a, is a very real curiosity, if you can approach it properly. And the second thing that's always in my mind is that you can be in Washington so long you forget this. If you ask the people in the Muslim countries what are the number one, two, and three things in their lives, they never mention foreign policy. What they talk about is my faith, my family, education for my children, and ninth on that list is, is foreign affairs. So I always hold out the hope, since these people are our audiences, that we have a right to engage with them. What I don't disagree with ever is that we'll get there faster if we have partners like uh, Keith's business circle, which is inspiring because they've taken the initiative and they can go places we cannot go. On the other hand, we have to go together sometimes. Let me go to uh, Dr. Saharna. Um, I want to say I agree with both. Um, and our, our more arching framework, yes, as Mr. Reinhardt said, the U.S., it is the messenger and it's not credible. And that we're going to have, a, I mean, that's theoretically, it's, there's a big problem with that. But then also, public diplomacy is the U.S. government. That's its responsibility. Other people have other parts, but public diplomacy is inherently the government, I see it as the government's charge. Um, but how to work together on that? That's the thing I think the government can do, more partnerships, and also with local NGOs. Um, working with international NGOs, their most valuable possession is their credibility. If the U.S. links up with them, they're going to be afraid it's going to affect their credibility. But the U.S. can get as extra mileage if it enhances the local, works with the local NGOs on the ground, does capacity building or anything along that line. And working with American businesses, um, those linking those two NGOs, an American NGO and a foreign NGO, and getting them to find private funding, such as an American corporation, they share the problems, they share the rewards, they build the links, and the U.S. gets the credibility. Mr. Chairman, um, Sesame Workshop is one of those NGOs that is trying to do, I guess, a version of public diplomacy called Muppet Diplomacy, where we have been working around the world now in over 120 countries trying to promote issues around literacy and numeracy and respect and understanding and health and hygiene. And we've been very active in the Arab world. We have gotten good support from U.S. government agencies like AID, but we've also gotten support from other governments, from Canada, from Holland, from the European Union to help promote respect and understanding uh, in the West Bank and in Gaza. And we are one of those NGOs, I think, as my colleague said, who can I, make a difference. And I have to tell you that it is about listening, it is about facilitating. Americans, like our group, 300 of us, uh, based in New York, who are working around the world trying to make a difference. It's about creative engagement as educators to intervene and promoting universal values. And we have not really, in any country in the world, run into uh, a huge obstacle that did not allow us to complete our mission. So we are engaged currently. We're in Afghanistan having dubbed programs. So, so, but the message that, it, and I, my time is up, and uh, Ms. Cherney's here, and, and uh, so I want to make sure we go on. I'd, I'd like to have a second pass, Mr. Chairman, if I could, but, but, but all I hear you gentlemen saying is that we can't just depend on public diplomacy, uh, that the private side can do a, a, a tremendous amount to present a case, but it, it, it strikes me that Secretary Beards isn't suggesting it only be public, and so Dr. Saharna, uh, you are the great conciliator here who has brought us all together. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um. Okay. 
One of the questions that, that I, I have concerning Al Jazeera uh, relates to the, the issues of the, the shared values that have, have been discussed. Can you move the mic closer to you? I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the questions that I have about Al Jazeera is that the issue of you know so many people that who have testified before us today talk about the concept of shared values and how uh, America needs to portray more the the, um, uh, the common bonds and and explain its policies and. I, I know that we may never agree on the issues of American policies. I, I, you might, I of course, recall that during our second panel, I read um, from, uh, you had a September 26, 2003 interview where you were talking about the causes of September 11th, and you reflected and said that, um, um, and you cited the first Iraq war. Uh, we call that the uh, liberation of Kuwait, and you refer to it as the first Iraq war. Many of those, conflicts of policy we, we may not agree upon. But translating those conflicts of policies to global terrorism and the glorification of, of death and the suicide bombers and killing of others is something that I think we have a, uh, that we can look to you as having a responsibility for. And, and Al Jazeera has been at times, um, there have been allegations that you're cooperating with terrorists and terrorist organizations. At a minimum, there's been certainly uh, the, um, the allegation that Al Jazeera glorifies uh, the, um, uh, the, the culture of death. You said you merely reflect the, um, uh, the culture in which you're representing or, or your market. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, you know, what is Al Jazeera's view of its role in um, global terrorism? where some view you as a uh, facilitator. Um, what do you view as your responsibility uh, toward uh, really s stability um, in the world? Thank you for your question. Um, well, first of all, I would like to distinguish between two things, my own personal views, such as the one that you read in uh, an interview that I made in September 2003, trying to explain to uh, an interviewer uh, or an audience uh, what I would personally consider uh, reasons or causes that many experts try to find for 9-11, uh, going back to uh, the Gulf War of 1991 or liberation of the uh, Kuwait War or the first Iraq War. There are so many names of it. So if I choose one, it does not mean in any way eliminating the other or against to, uh, another title for, for that war. Uh, and uh, between that, my personal views that I can indulge in, if uh, you would like me to speak about it, and uh, Al Jazeera itself, uh, that is a station that is uh, committed to presenting both sides of the story in any event, in covering the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, as I mentioned, we have Israeli officials, Israeli commentators speak, and we have Palestinians, regardless of their affiliation, also speak. Uh, uh, on the uh, uh, war uh, uh, against terrorism uh, or the Al-Qaeda issue. We also allowed uh, videotapes or statements made from uh, uh, people uh, related to Al-Qaeda, uh, as well as we are covering live and extensively almost, uh, I would say, more than 400 to 500 hours of President Bush's speeches live carried on Al Jazeera since 9-11. If you maybe count all what Al Jazeera broadcast since 9-11 of Bin Laden tapes, it might not be more than five hours in its all entirety. But people, of course, I understand that they will say Al Jazeera Bin Laden because they only heard the tape on Al Jazeera. But for them, that President Bush is available everywhere, so why should they mention Al Jazeera uh, uh, on it? The same way that people would go that the only bomber manifesto was in New York Times. That does not in any way mean that New York Times was collaborating with the only bomber or trying to promote ideas of a terrorist uh, or the publisher of uh, Timothy McVeigh book about why did he do the terrible things in Oklahoma. And by the way, Timothy McVeigh was a soldier in Iraq, in the first Iraq war or the 1991 war, and I believe at some point in his book mentioned that he learned how it's easy to kill people during that war. The Washington uh, sniper was a veteran or someone who was in the 1991 war. And when I mentioned the 91 war, I mentioned that also the violence and the war create violence and destabilize. And that could be one of the reasons. Uh, I could. Uh, if you would like me to focus on one thing, I'd like just to say that the message and the mission of Al Jazeera is represented very clearly in uh, uh, our motto, 
the opinion and the other opinion or the opposite opinion. And we have been faithful to that and also we have been uh, criticized harshly first in the region and now uh, uh, in the U.S. or after 9-11 in the U.S. for that reason. Bringing both sides of the, of the story uh, and asking people, please do not shoot the messenger if you don't like the message. Secretary Beers, uh, the, the shared values programming that you had put together is an, an attempt to, um, to communicate in a, um, if you will, a, a, um, a relationship and, and include, of course, an, an anti-terror message or anti-terror goal. Uh, our committee has information that, that Al Jazeera refused to carry those. Is that, is that correct or is that inaccurate? Well, I think what happened is, I'm sorry <laughs> to repeat this, but the word came back to me that Al Jazeera had moved their rate up to double, double the normal rate because it was hazardous material. I'm not sure it was put quite like that. <laughs> and we were refused in a number of governments, but in this case, I think it was, um, we felt a very disproportionate rate, and we had it covered with some other um, networks. So I think we didn't go on it. I'm not so sure that they said no to us, and I'm working from a memory there. Perhaps you know. May I comment on that? Yeah. Please. Because it came to our attention, that complaint from uh, a colleague at the State Department working in public diplomacy, and at that time there was a visit by the general manager of Al Jazeera uh, in Washington, and when he heard that he was outraged and made some phone calls, we found out that the person that was contacted, the advertising agent in the region, Who's, who is the one who uh, told, the, uh, told the people who carried the advertisement that I could buy for you uh, more time than Al Jazeera for that money and convinced them not to go to Al Jazeera but they could get more time for their money than going to Al Jazeera but not Al Jazeera that declined it. Al Jazeera actually until now uh, put uh, advertisement that uh, uh, I would say even glorify or put very positive spin on the Iraqi uh, an uh, interim uh, constitution or uh, uh, interim law, many other things, uh, and we are welcome, even if someone would like to, put, to bring these ads back, we we'll welcome them, but I, I think they might need to be updated because some of the people featured in these ads, I believe, have been harassed by FBI agents or had some bad experience after 9-11, so maybe they need to update it. Thank you. Secretary Beers, you look like you want to comment on that. No, on I'm that. just sorry. I didn't know what he said about the FBI agent. Do you want to expound on that? that, that certainly I'm saying that uh, the more we also we promote the stories of Arab Americans, and we do promote these stories. Last thing, last thing is given, for example, I, I host a talk show from Washington, and in that talk show, I brought a story of a mayor uh, of Wayne, Michigan in which I said, let's positive news in Thanksgiving in America, let's ex explain that this guy won election, mayoral election, while he had only two Arab American families in Wayne, Michigan. And it, it was in November 2001, immediately after 9-11, yet people in Wayne choose this guy. So we are not short in putting positive things in, in America, but the problem also that you follow what happened to Arab Americans since uh, the last two months, the FBI has been rounding and meeting and interviewing Arab Americans uh, just to, to interview them, ask about their views, their religious beliefs, and the excuse for that has been in order uh, just to uh, remind people that we are there or collecting information as preventive measures. These things also does affect American image, uh, as well as the Census Bureau when they were asked by the Homeland Security to give us information about all the Arabs living in any zip code, more than 1,000 Arabs in any zip code that have more than 1,000 Arabs, give us the names. And that was very, uh, was a reminder for, of, for people to what happened in World War II. And uh, thanks to Homeland Security people, their civil rights officer was in Al Jazeera in my show, explained things, and uh, I believe they promised to correct the matter. So sometimes the experience of Arab Americans has to be reflected in order to give credibility to the message. But if it's an advertisement, we don't have to ask you to do whatever we will broadcast it as advertisement. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for their testimony. Uh, there are some who say that no matter how good we get at uh, public diplomacy or think we're getting at public diplomacy, that we won't be 
really good at it in this area of the world unless we learn to listen better, uh, enhance listening skills. Would each of you tell me whether or not you think the United States is, in fact, listening uh, to people in this region of the world? If not, how would we enhance those skills and proceed from there? Maybe start with uh, Mr. Ambrosi. As I mentioned, the interaction is very important. It's very important to engage U.S. policymakers uh, in Arab media interviews and in talking to uh, uh, to the Arab people because it's it's uh, it gives them a chance in order to answer questions, to take follow-up questions, and that's very important. Just not to make it a monologue because we carry a lot of press conferences as monologue, but in order to answer questions and to be sincere, maybe to take it back and digest and in a, in a weekly meeting say we heard that and we couldn't have, we couldn't have a, an answer or a good answer. And I just give the example of the Homeland Security with the Census Bureau. We had someone from Homeland Security, the second day immediately they had a meeting with Arab Americans and they explained almost like regret what happened and said that has to be corrected in a very sensitive manner in the future. I think as you mentioned, sir, listening is very important and as we are talking about review of U.S. intelligence, review of many other things. I think a review of U.S. foreign policy in the region is important, and we should not deal with foreign policy as if it is something on the side. Foreign policy is, uh, means a domestic policy for people who are at the receiving end in the Middle East, whether they are Iraqis or Palestinians or Egyptians. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, are we listening? No. Um, because if, if we were, I mean, there's one thing, all of this, the Palestinian-Israeli keeps coming up, and now the situation in Iraq, and um, Najaf now, the, what's going on in the religious site. Um, before there was the superpower rivalry and there was the nuclear threat, and everybody looked at that. Now that that's gone, these foreign policy issues have become like the glaring spotlight. And if we were listening, um, we would have heard and done things maybe differently. And if, it's, if we have a security problem here in the U.S., America's allies in the region are sitting on a more dangerous security problem by not addressing the foreign policy issues. What do you think we would have heard? What do you think we would have learned? If we were listening, what we would have heard if we were listening. Oh, my goodness. Um, sorry, the, the military in the region, uh, the American military, these are the young, this was America's best face, young American people being in the region. And some of the actions that were conducted out of cultural ignorance um, and cultural sensitivity have, have tarnished and bruised more than anything. And um, that's, that's the biggest thing. They are the face of the American public diplomacy. Thank you. Mr. Reinhardt. We talk to uh, people on the streets in 130 countries. And uh, this was a, a question leading the witness, obviously, because we asked them for advice on uh, what they would give to Americans traveling abroad. But the, the, the two most uh, frequently recurring words were listen and respect. And uh, some of the quotes, uh, learn to listen instead of talking all the time. And then they went on to say, and if you must talk all the time, would you please lower the volume? Uh, stop comparing everything we do to the way you do it. If you can't stop talking, turn down the volume I mentioned. You might try learning a few words in our language. The Super Bowl uh, does not mean much to us. If we had a, an athletic competition called the World Series, it would occur to us to invite other nations, and on and on. And then some of the <laughs> some of the uh, some of the uh, verbatims uh, about uh, the, the negative uh, perceptions, the ones I had on the screen about the insensitivity to cultural differences and and the supreme arrogance uh, which kept coming through was that our assumption is that they want to be exactly like us. I think 
uh, so one of our, uh, I'm in the advertising business, and one of our big national, multinational clients spends $30 million on research that's no human resources, no capital, just $30 million on research around the world to win friends for their brand. Uh, I believe the, the federal government spends something like $5 million. We can listen better and unleash creativity more. Um, I think we can connect around children. This isn't just a news ping pong match, even though it sometimes turns out that way. Um, education and culture, as was mentioned before, is really important. In Egypt, when we did Alam Simsim, the Egyptian Sesame Street, this is a local show, they chose to promote girls' education and health and hygiene. That was not us dictating to them. And in the West Bank, our Palestinian partners tell us the biggest problem for the average person is boredom. They're unemployed, they can't leave their houses, they're blockaded from traveling to visit relatives. So what are they doing? They're watching television. What are they watching? We've heard about some of that today. So being able to give them some of the resources and the technology to promote positive values about their own cultures and self-esteem and to create empathy is something that we're doing and other people are trying to do. And I would encourage the committee to think about how our government can help promote some of those things in the private sector moving forward. Thank you. Secretary Beers. In the uh, goal that I started with, which I think is modest compared to how we would like to approach our relationship with the Middle East, it ha I, I talk about mutual understanding, and you really can't get there unless you have a reasonable comprehension and empathy with whom you're attempting to speak. And this is kind of a golden rule for all communication. But in addition to understanding that, you have to be prepared for some kinds of action, some kinds of programs or exchanges that activate. That's why I like so much the picture of the teenager in Cairo being able to talk to whomever he chooses in Idaho because what happens there has its own chemistry and it's not so artificial. I know that any program we put together, whether it's, it's in the private sector or something the government manages to put on the table, that is people to people, there is a kind of a kinetic energy and chemistry that takes place there. Um, so it's listening and also being prepared to take part in a responsible exchange and action. So I, I take somewhat from, from this that there's general agreement on the panel that the Commission's report recommending that we rebuild scholarship exchange and library programs reaching out to young people is right on the money. The general agreement on that? No, I, no, I actually, I'm sorry I'm that. always doing this, but I do agree with those things. They're vital and they, they do, uh, that's why we're always quoting to you how many people in the world affairs came and studied here and now they're leaders. We're doing a very good job with elite and leaders, but you can't stop there and I'm just concerned that you'll think we mean just to expand those programs. In my mind, if you can't take those ideas of education, school, using the mm -hmm. local television, just like Sesame's mm -hmm. done, you're not going to get enough reach, nor will you make enough impact. So it's a, it's a modification. Okay. I accept that. Anybody else want to build I, I would just, uh, I, I would second that. And I would also uh, add that uh, in your invitation, you mentioned, uh, you quoted from the 9-11 report that the uh, bin Laden has nothing to offer but death and violence, and we have uh, to offer hope of a brighter future. Uh, I would respectfully uh, suggest that bin Laden has quite a bit to offer to these people, which is the word we kept hearing in our listening, respect and dignity, which he can grant. And if we can take our vision of hope and a brighter future and make it real, as Secretary Beers and Mr. Nell have said, by building bridges through this shared value of learning and education, that would be a very, very good place to start. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you had an interjection you wanted to make there. I, I would um, yield. I, I, thank you for yielding. I, I, but it's changed. Is that all right? <laughs> because what you said to me is, is stunning in a way but regretfully very true. And I'd love to get Al Jazeera's take on this as well. I, um, when I was in Iraq, 
I had more Iraqis say, thank you for getting rid of uh, Saddam Hussein and when are you leaving, in the same sentence. <laughs> and there's yeah. this wonderful poll that said two-thirds wanted us to stay and two-thirds wanted us to leave. <laughs> um, and, but, but what it struck me was, the, 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 and it seemed reasonable, I mean, when you think about it, it's reasonable. We didn't want it to be a French revolution in, the, in our revolutionary war, we wanted it to be the American revolution. Uh, and, not, and so um, I, I found that they were very, very proud people. And the little things that we did that we think were inconsequential were huge to them. And, and then all these wonderful things we did just seemed meaningless. And, and that's why I, 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 um, um, I, I, I think that you have done something, uh, uh, you've, you've got the first criticism of this report that I basically can accept because your comment was the only thing he has to offer is. And I accepted that and I believe it on one level, but on another level, he promises them something that they don't seem to feel from us and that's dignity and respect. And people were willing to lose their lives for that, which is uh, obs obscene to me. What's your take on this as you hear this, Mr. Almirazi? Mr. Chairman, if we would look to, uh, into criticizing the whole report, I would also mention that uh, there is a failure when it comes to uh, U.S. help and details of U.S. help to uh, Al-Qaeda or the founders of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan uh, the people who originated it, or who used to be called in the Arab world the Arab Afghanis, people who fought the Afghan war against the Russians over there. It is in the report, it's just a, a mention, a very uh, passing sentences about that US, Pakistan, and Saudis. But really, this is but part I of. I be clear that we're not, uh, you know, that we're being very clear. In other words, we supported the very elements that. Exactly. Now, yeah. Exactly, sir. And, and that's because this is, this is the need for a review of U.S. foreign policy, not just to say that we need more scholarships, more, more. That's, that's nice. That's important. We can't say that scholarships are not going to be uh, helpful. Of course it will. But the drainage is, is still there. And, uh, and during the Cold War and Voice of America that I did work for before and other uh, in, in the U.S. and uh, the Saudi Arabia role has been mentioned that they were only involved in building mosques in the former Yugoslavia. Yes, they were building mosques with the support of the U.S. They were distributing copies of the Holy Quran with the support of the U.S. because they were fighting communism. And the U.S. was helping and supporting fundamentalism in the Arab world. Someone even quoted Mr. Casey, Bill Casey of the CIA, late CIA director, as saying the more fundamentalist uh, uh, they get me in Afghanistan, the better because they kill more communists. I mean, so we supported that brand. The U.S. supported that brand. The U.S. used the Islamic religion and the Wahhabism in order to conquer the Soviet Union. And now uh, we are talking about madrasa. Madrasa, by the way, is just means a, a school in Arabic. It's religious schools. Uh, and when, you, when, when people here in the Arab and Muslim world hear U.S. officials uh, 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 attacking madrasa, just, just by the way, madrasa, it meant for them as if someone is attacking in the Arab world Christian schools or charter schools. So we, we, we also have to, uh, to find out exactly what do we mean and what exactly are we talking about. And, and let's compare. The Palestinians have raised that issue before when they told them, we need to look into hatred in your textbooks. And many people said, we, will look, we would like to look into hatred not only in Palestinian textbooks, in Israeli textbooks. We need to look into hatred or anti-Islamic statements in U.S. media as well as in the Arab media of the other way around. That's this comprehensive view, the clear condemnation of, of killing any innocent, whether that innocent Palestinian or that innocent Israeli, is very helpful. Being consistent and up to the values of the U.S. I don't think that the Arabs or the Muslims have different values than the Americans, because these are human values. People are taking uh, uh, every generation and ad adding to it and enhancing to it. So if we stand for liberty and justice for all, Palestinians will tell you how about liberty for us? Why it, w it was not difficult, why it was not difficult for you to keep Iraqi occupation for eight months under Saddam, and it's fine with you to keep 
Israeli occupation more than 36 years. And you have to find the answers for them. Uh, and I think this is what uh, we're talking about, engaging in dialogue and really sitting down and re-evaluating re US foreign policy toward the Arab and Muslim world, not because of 9-11, but just because we've, we need it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Um, did you want to make a comment, Ms. Sarna? I wanted to just, I mean, what Mr. Reinhardt brought up about the appeal of bin Laden. Excuse me, let and me just say, I'm, it's my intention to end this hearing in like five minutes. And okay, so, I'm done. No, 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 that's not my point. <laughs> no, that, that, I, I, it's just that I want people to know so they can judge their time and so on. But, but I want you to say whatever you want, and then I want other people to as well. Islam when he put, what does he have to appeal, and he said human dignity and respect. Um, it hit me today, I thought this thing from the Council on Muslim was very important. Bin Laden is getting a lot of mileage, extra mileage, by the U.S. calling it Islamism. Because Islam is my religion also, and I've read a ton of reports. I can't distinguish between Islamism, fundamentalism, this and is an extremism. And, it's Islam, and no matter how you slice it or dice it, they'll hear it that way. And so what do you call it? I mean, you, you, can't, you can't call it. Call I think it. the commission did a great thing by narrowing it from terrorism to Al-Qaeda, and then if get it away from religion. Because, pe and I've read a lot of reports, too, in the, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, can't, they're not distinguishing it either. And I was, it's an but, important but, but, thing. I mean, the, the reality is, it's, it's not Japanese. Uh, Japanese uh, a country. It, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not uh, um, uh, Hindus that are basically um, attacking the United States right now. It is a particular uh, group uh, that's very narrow among a particular religious uh, belief. And, so, you know, that's kind of like we got to face the reality. That's what it is. Now you're saying in facing reality, it's offensive. So, Islam, it's gays getting mileage from it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and as the 9 11 Commission said several, several times, it's a very, very small group. The Commission did a great job by taking terrorism and narrow it. The more we can narrow it, the stronger that's going to be, but if you can get away, and they debated, and but it just hit me today. This guy's getting a lot of mileage. Okay, fair enough, and it's important for us to know that. Yes, um, yes. I don't. You know, go on, go on. Listen, you have something to contribute. I, the last thing I want to do is stop you. What, what else did you want to say? Oh, that's it. Okay. Yes. And just to second what you said, uh, uh, I know it is easier for foreign audience to identify with something, but it's also risky, and we have to consider that. I heard a lot of feedback, negative one, when the word the Islamist and the Islamic terrorist were put into the commission. By the way, we carried live two hours of the commission when they finished the reporting it. Uh, and w using words like Al-Qaeda, uh, uh, or Bin Laden followers, or something like that. It's clear the same way that we're talking about the IRA, not the Catholic Irish. Uh, uh, regardless of how many Catholic Irish would identify with the IRA, but we say I, uh, it is the IRA, and I think it is very important to do that because uh, uh, you, you, you have also uh, uh, Jewish uh, terrorists who are on the list of terrorist organization of the State Department. Okay, two organizations, this, but we don't use that and because I, it's know, dangerous. And I agree with what you're saying, yet I wrestle with this. They use as their basis their Islamic faith. And, and, that's and the U.S. is giving them extra mileage. Okay, and but no, but and they, they kill but Muslims in Algeria, for example, saying Muslims. So people in Algeria understand it, and people in the Arab world understand that they can distinguish Islamists because those people who carry the Islamic banner. But when you take it to Western audience, and, and uh, send it back to the Arab world or the Muslim world, uh, it would sound for them as if you're talking about the whole Islam. But if it's indigenous, people yeah. say Islamist. Yeah, the scholars, they say Islamist doesn't mean Muslim, but it would be lost in translation. It, it, it's absolutely essential we know what it means. I mean, if we're gonna talk about winning hearts and minds, if that's what it means, 
then even however helpful it may be to us, it's ultimately going to have a huge negative. Would you have any comment on this, Secretary Beers? Well, I think that we've tried to be very careful about that word, and we've used sometimes the word radical as, as a way of defining the extreme end that happens in any religious endeavor. There's always a, a small group at the very end of it that, that are more radical and create uh, a different response to the whole religious practice. I don't have a solution, and I don't know what anyone would offer us in the way of a proper word. A political name? Well, just a name we can use in communication. In well, I mean, the bottom line is, yeah, you, you've told us what we can't do. I'm not sure what we can do, and that's right. basically your point. I mean, the, the, one of the values of the commission was that we need to know who we consider the terrorists and, and what do we call them. And I am guilty of saying a war on terror. And as one commissioner said, that's like taking Pearl Harbor and saying a war against the zero airplane which was the, me the, the, the vehicle to which Pearl Harbor was implemented, the, the use of that aircraft. But I don't say a war on zeros. Uh, and, and so right. it, it, it's something, I guess, that we're just all going to have to sort out. What is a name that means something that's helpful to us in knowing who ultimately we have to deal with, and, but, without, but doing it in a way that doesn't uh, come across uh, to an entire world population uh, as a huge negative. And, and um, anyway, I, um, is there anything that any of you, would you have any last question? Is there anything that you would like to put on the record, any of you? I yes. Um, outside the debate of, of we had about when to activate the, govern, the government as messenger, I would just like to say for the record that Richard, Ron, uh, Richard, <laughs> Well, his name is Keith. Keith <laughs> Reinhardt, whom I know, I've okay, known. Sally, I think. Yes, <laughs> I've known him for 35 years. Yeah. And I've and known I, you for 35 uh, years. Hey, you know, I, I, there may be some no, things wait, you want to keep private here. No, <laughs> really. Sesame I'm, Street's in the middle, don't worry. <laughs> this is not easy not to be interrupted. I'm I am sorry. trying to say something good about him. I've never succeeded I want you to yet. start all over. <laughs> <laughs> for the record, Mr. Yes. Reinhardt, has provided the most remarkable leadership I have ever seen in that organization that came to life under his jurisdiction about a year and a half ago. These people didn't exist. He brought together the most elite team imaginable. They're people who don't have time to do anything, and they show up, and they work with him, and they're going to do something remarkable in behalf of our country. And I just hope they get the recognition. Well, Secretary that. Beers, let me just say to you, that your service to our country and your contribution to this committee um, is, is very appreciated. You have been a wonderful um, uh, servant to, uh, to America, and, and we appreciate it ex uh, more than you can imagine. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to ask if anyone else has any comment. I had one, one thing. I actually had three pages here about how <laughs> Highly I regard Secretary Beers, but in oh, the interest of time, I'll just publish that for you. You sound, I did, you sound a, a little bit uh, not uh, sincere. Oh, no. Okay. No. Oh, no. Uh, okay. We, 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 we met in church. He'd have to we've be been sincere. very close friends. All right. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to get back. We were talking about listening, uh, and, and we've also been talking about messages. And the best advice I ever received on the subject was you don't learn anything by talking, and I really think we have to keep that in mind. I also wanted to say what Professor Georges, uh, how he envisions this. He talks about the floating uh, block of young people in Iran, and according to him, they haven't made up their mind yet, whether to buy the Mullah's brand or the Western brand. It's essential that we make our ideas, which stem from their wants, their needs, their shared values, accessible to them, however we do that. And the last thing I would like to say, Mr. Chairman, is uh, a quote from one of our young staffers in Cairo. And I believe that he gives us really good advice for a mindset that we should bring to this discussion. He says, in investment, America must be presented as the facilitator, not the patron. In the realm of charity, as the partner, not the philanthropist. And in business endeavors, as the courier of progress, and not the preachers of westernization. If we can all become couriers of progress, I think we will make great progress for our country.
Nice way to end up. I would be happy to have both of you just make a comment if you would like. Do you? Thank you. Yeah. I just have uh, sure. uh, uh, first uh, thing that I would hope and renew my, uh, my request for uh, interviews for Al Jazeera with the three of you, and that would be gr uh, grateful and glad that would help promote U.S. Uh, and explain and articulate U.S. policies and U.S. Uh, views to the Arab world with no uh, 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 expense to taxpayers, uh, unlike Al Hurra uh, television. <laughs> and uh, just to correct for the record, uh, in the previous panel, we were criticized by one of the uh, speakers and the panelists as comparing Al Jazeera to uh, the National Enquirer. The harshest critics to Al Jazeera compared it to Fox News, but here I got a demotion <laughs> <laughs> being compared, compared <laughs> to <laughs> National Enquirer. Now, this is the first time I've seen you smile today. So <laughs> Thank you. And uh, li let me just for the record, and I would like anyone to have a commission, independent commission, to compare Al Jazeera, uh, Washington Bureau coverage of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. policies in general compared to the U.S. Al Hurra tel television. We have started since the primaries in January uh, a weekly one-hour election show to explain to our audience every Tuesday and run twice, again rerun twice, what the U.S. political system is, what does it mean, what is electoral you actually college. actually able to explain that? I should watch. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're <laughs> and, and, and uh, Al Hurra just started like two weeks ago. <laughs> to do something like us, to, to follow like Well, you know, a competition is good. So you took the lead and they're, they're uh, following. So that's just what I'm no, saying. I, Thank I, you. The one thing, I, I, I have been encouraging our government to have Al Hora, but I think it will help you be better, and I think it will help them be better. They, I think that they only have credibility if they tell the truth. And, and what I had was I had one or two um, individuals call me up from the media uh, criticizing something that we were doing that seemed anti-American. And I said, but it, if, if that's what happened, it needs to be said for their own credibility. In other words, they had people on the program that others wondered whether they should have on the program. So, uh, you know, I realize there's a lot of questions that... And I agree with you, sir. I mean, the more the merrier, and it is not a zero-sum game. Right. Funding Al Hurra does not mean boycotting Al Jazeera or the Arab media. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, we look forward to uh, a continued dialogue in this. You all have... Uh, I think helped us understand this better. And uh, ultimately, I believe this, if not uh, more, it's certainly equal to all the other efforts that we have in our government. Uh, uh, we're not going to succeed unless we do better with public diplomacy and also improve our public policy. Thank you all very much. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned without a gap. If you missed any of this hearing, it will air again tonight, beginning at 8 Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN. And at 8 here on C-SPAN 2, a hearing on terrorism financing. The House Financial Services Committee met today with Lee Hamilton, the vice chair of the 9-11 Commission. Congressman Chris Shays, who chaired the hearing that we just watched, is going to be on our Washington